It is my duty to inform the House that the Speaker is unavoidably absent. Therefore, in accordance with the statutes, I would ask the Deputy Speaker to please take the chair. O oh, eternal God, almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as they may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O oh, merciful God, that we pray thee, that we may desire only in which is in accordance with thy will, that we seek it with wisdom, know it with certainty, and accomplish it perfectly, for the glory and honor of thy name, and for the welfare of all our people. Amen. Please be seated. Routine proceedings. The Honourable Government. How? Oh yeah. Before we begin, the House rose yesterday. Uh, the Honourable Member of the Point Douglas was speaking on the manner of privilege she was had raised. I will now recognize the member to conclude her remarks by moving a motion. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. So I rise on an important matter of privilege. The care and concern shown to children is of the utmost importance. And this informs the privilege of all members here in this very House. The matter I wish to bring forward today is serious and a long-standing concern. The matter concerns the fact that the government has failed to proclaim I don't think everyone was here. I want them to hear. Oh, okay. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. This impact my privilege. While myself as a legislator, my rights of an MLA have been impeded by children coming into my office, and I'll share a few examples of that. So I had a young 16-year-old uh, female come into my office about six months ago asking to be able to access the services of the Manitoba Child Advocate. But because she wasn't a child in care, she wasn't allowed to access those services. And in fact, the Manitoba Child Advocate's office sent her to my office because she lived in my ridings to get me to advocate for this young woman to be able to get advocacy from the Manitoba Advocate. So, you know, the Manitoba Advocate has continually been, you know, asking this government to put into legislation, and we know that in this very House, that the Act was given royal assent over a year ago. And this young woman, like I said, was in my office six months ago. And we've still been trying to work with her to get her uh, the services she needs. Uh, she isn't a child that's living at home. She's been couch surfing. But she's not allowed to access the services of the Manitoba Child Advocate. And I want to go back to you know why the Child Advocate's uh, role was expanded in the first place. When we think about you know the young 15-year-old Tina Fontaine and how she fell through so many cracks and ended up you know being murdered and found in the Red River, these are this is just one example that we do not want to repeat in this province. And this government, by not bringing that legislation in, is opening you know young people up to this possibly happening to them. And. They need to access the services of the Manitoba Child Advocate. And having a year of it being proclaimed and not actually being put into legislation by you know, the, this, very, uh, this very place, Didn't you do this we have to, you know, in fact, make sure that we're looking after all children in this province and not just children that are in the CFS system. 
And right now, Deputy Speaker, that impedes my job as a, the MLA for Point Douglas to fully do my job and service my I'm constituents. Awesome. Because I can't say to this young girl that, hey, you can go access the service of the man trouble child advocate. Because in fact, this young child, young woman, cannot. And she's still been couch surfing for six months now without any services. She doesn't want to go into child and family services. She needs some advocacy to make sure that she gets the services she needs. And uh, the child advocate actually wants to provide services to this child, but because it has not been proclaimed in this very house, they are limited in the scope and the support that they are allowed to supply to, to children in this province. And the children... Order. Could the Honourable Member for Point Douglas, um, uh, I would encourage you to move out your motion. To, um, uh, you're starting to debate again, and, and uh, we want to confirm that it is a prima facie uh, violation. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker, and I'm just trying to share some examples of how my job as an MLA for Point I, Douglas order, is being I believe that the person from Point, the member from Point Douglas is challenging the Speaker. I ask that the member from Point Douglas please um, conclude her um, motion, the Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. So my ability is impeded as an MLA to perform my functions because when people come into my office and then are trying to access the services that, that the child advocate uh, again, office... Again, I would warn the member for Point Douglas to um, put forward her motion on the um, prima facie violation. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. The honourable member for Point Douglas. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. So as the MLA for Point Douglas, and you know, when people come into my office and I'm impeded by doing my job, the act that was given royal assent over a year ago, and yet the government has refused to proclaim it, this impedes my ability as an MLA to perform my functions, which I cannot uh, service my constituents in Point Douglas because the government has not The Honourable Member for uh, Point Douglas, you've repeated yourself many times, even through last yesterday and then even today. So would the Member for Point Douglas please for, 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 forward her motion? The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. So I've taken the time to consult authorities and I've... and experts on the matter and ob have observed the actions of government officials and other individuals on this issue. I have taken the time in order to form my opinion and do the research on this matter. As such, order. I move seconded hmm, by the member hmm, from Concordia. It's the only one she knows that of. this matter. <laughs> be moved to an all-party committee for consideration. Before recognizing any other members to speak, I would remind the House to, uh, that remarks at this time for the honorable members are limited to strictly relevant comments about whether the alleged matter of privilege has been raised at the earliest opportunity, whether the prima facie case has been established. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Clearly, the timeliness uh, has not been met as a matter that's been raised several times in the House previously. Uh, it is certainly not a prima facie case, um, Mr. Deputy um, Speaker. I will say again, and I'm glad that the member's opposite comments were being broadcast on TV, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, glad but also a little sad uh, that people have to see 
uh, how the NDP is acting in the legislature at an unprecedented time, not in Manitoba's history and not in Canada's history, but in the history of the world, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I said this somewhat yesterday. When Manitobans have gone through uh, different emergencies in the past, whether that's war or floods, and I remember more distinctly the flood of 1997, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where people came together and there was concern and there was fear and there was a lot of worry during the flood of 1997 and, and nobody knew exactly how that would entirely play out. But when it did play out and when it was over, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, more than they remembered the water and more than they remembered uh, the fear that they might have had at the time, they remembered what they did to help their neighbours and what they did to help other Manitobans. That was the endearing and enduring memory of the 1997 flood. Now, there are many things left to be done and written about the pandemic that is happening in the world and, and uh, has been called in Manitoba as well, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I believe that when it is over, however long that takes, that what will be remembered most clearly is what Manitobans did for each other, what neighbours did for each other, what communities did for each other, whether that was helping them get supplies or helping them uh, socially uh, to get through uh, uh, periods where they may have been isolated, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And long after we've moved past COVID-19, what will sustain Manitoba in their memories will be how we did it together. But a little bit of that memory, a little bit of that memory will always be what the NDP, the New Democratic Party, who wants to purport to be government, did at that time. And I think it will linger in the memories of Manitobans for a very long time Order. and they ultimately end up going to the ballot box and asking for support to be a government. People will remember, would you choose a government who acted at a time of a pandemic emergency the way they are acting now? Because if they act like this now, Order. how would they ever act when it wasn't an emergency, Mr. Deputy Order. Speaker? The Honourable Member for River Heights. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Order. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on this matter of privilege, uh, clearly uh, this was a matter which could have been, was indeed raised earlier on. Uh, Order. It doesn't qualify as a matter of privilege. If the member for Point Douglas had wanted to raise concerns about children and youth, she should have been following what's going on in Manitoba at the moment. She should have been following that daycares have been cancelled as of the end of the day on Friday. Uh, there are many questions which we need to ask the government. Uh, where will the children go? One presumes at home, but that's not always easy and sometimes may not be possible. Where will the child care workers get paid? Will they just suddenly lose their income? The government hasn't provided an answer. Will essential workers in health care and other areas be able to have the child care they need so they can work? And the government has indicated that they're working on this, but that they don't have a solution yet. How will those who are working now who have to stay at home because there's no childcare, how will they get an income? How will they be able to pay their bills? Uh, how will Manitobans, so many Manitobans who will be affected by the measure, how will they survive in these turbulent times? The government needs to provide an answer. And the opposition... Order. The opposition needs to provide an answer as to why they are showing an extraordinary level of disrespect for the rest of the legislature. The opposition needs to... Don't remember for uh, River Heights. The opposition needs to explain when they should have been in question period and asking questions why they are raising matters of privilege. 
There are many other options that the opposition has to influence the course of legislation. And by raising matter of privilege after matter of privilege, the opposition is actually using up time that we should be debating important bills and discussing them and criticizing them and raising issues that will result as the bills having been tabled. Uh, those are my comments. Merci, miigwech. Uh, 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 thank you. A matter of privilege is a serious concern. I am going to take this uh, matter under advisement to consult with authorities. I will return to the House with a ruling. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker, on House Business. Um, the Honourable Member for uh, Point Douglas on House Business. Uh, the, well, I'm sorry, the Honourable Member for um, Opposition House Leader on Business, uh, House Business. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. I would like to canvass the House for leave to set aside. Pardon me. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I would like to ask the Honourable Member for St. John's. Deputy Speaker, I would like to ask you to canvass the House for leave to set aside routine proceedings today, move to orders of the day, and the presentation of the budget speech, including all stages of the budget procedure listed on page 84 of the rule book in Appendix D, including the tabling of all budget documents. Thanks. It has been. Um, so uh, is, there is there leave that uh, to, to canvass the House to, uh, to set aside routine proceedings today, move to the orders of the day and pre pre presentations of the budget speech, including all stages of the budget procedures listed on page 84 of the rule books in a practice D, including the tabling of all budget documents? Is it up? No, I hear no. The, uh, how, the leave has been denied. The member for the Honourable Government House Leader on House Business. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Is there leave for the House to not see the clock today until all stages of the budget procedure listed on page 84 of the rule book in Appendix D, including the tabling of all budget documents, are completed? Is there leave for the House to seat the clock today until all stages of budget procedures listed in page 84 of the rules booked in Apprentice D, including the tabling of all budget documents, are completed? It's not to see the clock. No? I hear no. Access? Leave is denied. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I ask leave uh, for all members uh, to move directly to the matter of urgent public importance and debate uh, the issues around COVID-19, which is a pandemic and which is affecting all of us and which all of us should be paying attention to. Is there leave to move that we um, discuss uh, debate about? Is it leave to move to magic urgence of COVID-19? Um, presented by the Honourable Member for River Heights. No, I hear no. Uh, leave is denied. The Honourable Member for Concordia on... On a matter of privilege. Um, the Honourable Member for Concordia on a, on a matter of privilege. Thank you very much, Mi Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, on a very important matter of privilege. Order. Before I do get to that matter of privilege, uh, I just wanted to, once again, on behalf of our caucus, uh, express our, uh, our gratitude to those frontline workers, <laughs> those teachers, uh, those nurses who are out there right now who are working hard to, uh, to uh, see us through this pandemic. Uh, we have so much gratitude for the work that they do and for those who are suffering right now who are uh, ill, uh, especially members of this uh, chamber or in addition to members of this chamber, I just wanted to, uh, to offer our, our sincere uh, condolences and our thoughts for your, uh, your situation that you're in right now. I do, however, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, rise on a very important matter of privilege, and it is one that I do believe is uh, incredibly timely, and uh, in particular at this time of year uh, is something that is on the minds of all Manitobans in addition 
to the struggles that we're having with, uh, of course, with COVID-19 and the global pandemic. Uh, the reason that I rise today with regard is with regards to uh, strategic infrastructure in this province and the ways in which this government has impeded my ability as a legislator to uh, execute my duties and serve the members of my constituency as well as all Manitobans at, at this important time. So as I said, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise on this uh, very important matter of privilege. And my matter of privilege is regarding the Pallister government's misstatement of what is called the strategic infrastructure budget, and in particular how that relates to flood mitigation and flood fighting uh, leading into a particularly uh, precarious spring. Uh, as to uh, the matter of timeliness, uh, I would like to address that first, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, once again, I believe that there is an opportunity to understand that phrase uh, in a slightly nuanced way. Uh, we understand that uh, timeliness and what's called the earliest opportunity uh, is an important part of a matter of privilege. It is, in fact, one of the uh, two most important uh, standards that must be met in order for a matter of privilege to be uh, considered here before the House. Uh, but we, what we would like to stress here, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that the earliest opportunity cannot simply mean the next immediate moment in time in which uh, any one member would have the ability to speak. We uh, believe that to be uh, too uh, simple of an understanding of this phrase and doesn't uh, truly take into account the realities that we have as legislators in the modern context. Uh, so we understand this to be something that must be uh, uh, taken into account within the context uh, in which uh, the legislator finds himself or herself, uh, but also for members be given the time to consult the relevant authorities, to be given the opportunity to study and to uh, consult the various experts on the matter, as the case may be, as well as to review the evidence that has been compiled on the matter at hand. And in this case, of course, there is uh, significant evidence that I would like to uh, uh, read into the record and uh, ensure that is being fully considered by yourself, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I believe uh, this sort of thorough review of the evidence will not only determine for a particular member whether they have a reasonably, uh, whether they reasonably ought to have believed that a matter of privilege has indeed been, been raised. That is that there is a uh, prima facie case for believing that a member of this chamber's privilege has been breached. But it will also form the basis of any ruling or judgment regarding that matter that the speaker or the deputy speaker uh, and uh, his or her team would uh, ultimately make. As a result of the uh, acquisition of correct and ac accurate information by members, it must be taken into account uh, and into consideration in the determination as to whether or not a member has brought their concern forward in that timely fashion. Thus, the question of reasonableness is not fully objective in the sense that there is a fixed or a set or a proper amount of time for bringing forward the matter of privilege to this House. In fact, what we would argue is that the question would depend both on the objective facts, which need to be uh, uh, sorted, uh, or uh, whether the information that is required in order to bring forward this uh, claim of a matter of privilege uh, his, has been forthcoming, whether it's been uh, made available in a timely fashion, and whether it's understandable or comprehensible for all members to, uh, to fully uh, sort through. So neither is the question, I would argue, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, either uh, fully subjective in this case. It cannot be a question of the speed of each individual member or on their willingness to expend the time to investigate a matter, to determine whether a matter of privilege has been brought to this House in a timely fashion. Uh, obviously, each member has uh, his or her uh, or their uh, 
uh, own resources that they bring to the table that they are able to uh, employ in order to, uh, to investigate a matter such as this. Uh, but it's also, I think, uh, an understanding that based on the, uh, the interests or the concerns of the member, that the timeliness would depend on whether their, uh, again, willingness to expend the time to fully investigate that matter. And that is, uh, I think, a very important nuance that does need to be uh, taken into account with regards to these, these matters. So it's properly understood then, uh, we would argue, as an intersubjective standard, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Therefore, a standard that must reflect the true capabilities of the members to acquire that information, to bring it forward to this House, and uh, taking into account, of course, the, uh, the demands that this House may reasonably make of all members to bring forward matters at the earliest opportunity. So then I would argue that the question of timeliness is best understood as contextual, as I stated earlier, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and this digression helps understand the timeliness question with respect to the matter that I am bringing forward today. So again, that would be my, uh, my argument with regards to the timeliness, and I do think that there is uh, uh, quite a bit there to parse through, and I do hope that uh, the Deputy Speaker, again, uh, the larger team, and uh, Madam Speaker herself, uh, consider those very, very carefully because they are, uh, I believe, uh, much more nuanced than a simple understanding of the, uh, the text might indicate. So therefore, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as to the test of privilege, um, which is the matter at hand, I refer to the House of Commons Procedure and Practice, the second edition, uh, which is commonly known as O'Brien and Bosk, for guidance on this particular question. Once again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we look to page Order. 11. Order. I just want to remind everyone if, uh, if you keep your discussions qu um, quietly and um, if you need to talk, go to the loge. Um, I just need to uh, hear the, uh, the speaker. Um, the only member for Concordia on the yeah. matter of privilege. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You know, it's, it's uh, quite telling that uh, members on the opposite side don't want to uh, listen to what we. Uh, I have to say here, there is a very important matters of privilege that are being brought forward, issues that I think are important to all Manitobans, and yet um, we, we uh, you know, obviously don't have the respect of those members to listen and to uh, pay attention to those, and uh, I think to give uh, you as Deputy Speaker that, that respect as well, which I think is so very important here in this, uh, in this place. So once again, uh, so I'm, what I'm referring to here, page 111, O'Brien and Bosk, where they write, uh, quote, a member may also be obstructed or interfered with in the performance of his or her parliamentary functions by non-physical means. In ruling on such matters, the speaker examines the effects of the in incident or event on what it had on the member's ability to fulfill his or her parliamentary responsibilities. So if, in the speaker's view, the member was not obstructed in their performance of his or her parliamentary duties and functions, then, in fact, a prima facie case of privilege cannot be found." End quote. Again, that is from uh, page uh, from Obrosk and Brine, uh, as I stated earlier, which is, uh, as we know here in this uh, chamber, the undisputed source of information regarding the appropriate way in which we ought to understand parliamentary privilege in this House as well as in the houses uh, across the country. Uh, several comments regarding these particular comments, um, I believe, are in order, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, we know that the Speaker's view of the matter is clearly of the utmost importance, uh, but more importantly, interference should not be construed in narrow physical terms. And we certainly know this from the work that we do as legislators here in this place. We know that interference in this case could be understood as uh, in a discussion of privilege or contempt that would go beyond uh, that physical interference. Say, uh, in this case, and I know you've given us guidance with regards to this 
in the past, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, say on the physical ability of members to enter the chamber, to occupy their seats, and therefore to, uh, to speak. That, of course, would be a very clear uh, indication or a clear um, execution uh, of, uh, of interference. And in that case, uh, a matter of privilege would be clear. It would be physical, it would be direct, and it would be something that uh, certainly would fit within the, uh, the guidelines that have been outlined by O'Brien and Bosk and, uh, and certainly the rules of this, uh, this chamber. However, in this case, uh, we, what we're arguing is that it would actually rather extend to any matter that would impede a member's ability to do their job. And it is this type of interference that one cannot fully be uh, enumerated in advance. Uh, this is a, an important uh, point that I think all members need to, uh, to think about very clearly. Uh, we, uh, we speak in this House uh, often of the ability to, uh, um, you know, to enter facts uh, on the record that are, uh, uh, some would argue, maybe uh, alternative facts or uh, <laughs> other phrases uh, that have been uh, constructed in order to, uh, uh, to justify one's uh, uh, playing fast and loose with those uh, particular facts. Uh, what I would argue, and in particular with this uh, case that we are discussing here, this matter of privilege that is before the uh, legislature uh, today, I, I think it is so very important to understand that the ability that we have as legislators to discuss and to uh, debate issues of importance to our constituents, or in this case, uh, issues that could affect all Manitobans as uh, potential floodwaters uh, once again come down uh, our rivers and, uh, and threaten many people in this province, it is absolutely vital that we once again have all the information with, uh, with which to, uh, uh, to make uh, quality uh, debate, uh, to ask questions that, uh, you know, that, that uh, get to the heart and to the point of the matter and uh, really give people the answers that they're seeking because that is uh, certainly what, uh, what folks are looking for uh, at this time, as they always are. <clears throat> so again, as, as Brian and Bosk note, it is impossible to codify all incidents which might be interpreted as matters of uh, obstruction. Uh, it would also be impossible to codify all incidents which would be uh, interpreted as interference. And likewise, it would be impossible to codify all incidents which might be interpreted as intimidation. And then, again, those would be very clear and they would be uh, very easy to build into a, a solid case of prima facie uh, case against uh, the uh, privilege of an individual member. Uh, however, uh, some matters that are found to be prima facie uh, include the damaging of a member's reputation, uh, the usurpation of the title of the Member of Parliament, the intimidation of members and their staff, and the intimidation of witnesses before committees and the provision of misleading information. I would emphasize uh, that last point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I believe that speaks most clearly to the argument that I am making here uh, this afternoon. Uh, the, uh, the most important authorities, arguably, apart from the Supreme Court of Canada, hold that the provision of misleading information constitutes a breach of privileges of members of this House. And it is clear that this government uh, and its premier ministers uh, have proven themselves to be guilty of the provision of such misleading information. It must be noted that information which is misleading is not the same, as I said earlier, as false information. Uh, the standard definition of misleading is that a statement or assertion gives the wrong idea or the wrong impression. However, it is clear, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the partial presentation of information which on its own is not incorrect can nonetheless give the wrong idea to a reasonable observer. And thus it bears repeating that the standard of the interference of a member's ability to do her job does not require her to show 
that the government provided false information, only misleading information. Now, again, we see this uh, daily, I would argue, uh, with regards to uh, how government operates. There have been many clever names given to this sort of uh, information that is given, but there is a major difference when the information that is given uh, is uh, misleading rather than simply false. And again, at a time when uh, members of this House are certainly doing the best that they can within their own constituencies to work with, uh, with their constituents, when they have questions, whether it's about daycare, about the, uh, the closure of schools, about uh, access to health care programs at this time of a global pandemic and of COVID-19, Likewise, in this case where members are also soon to be uh, uh, at the centre potentially of questions with regards to flooding and with regards to personal safety and uh, safety of property uh, that, uh, that they uh, are, are going to be most concerned about. This is, uh, we know, as the, the Premier has pointed out now uh, many times in his uh, uh, in his press conferences, uh, you know, the state of Manitoba right now, we know that COVID-19 is here. We know that the global pandemic is affecting the people of Manitoba in the same way that we know that the floodwaters of the, uh, of the Red and the Assiniboine will rise, and it's simply a question of how much, and that is where I believe that the information that we have as legislators is going to be so very vital and so important for us to, uh, to be able to provide to our constituents, to the wider public. Now, if I've been given false information, again, that's a dispute over the facts. That is, uh, I believe, I've uh, been covered many times uh, in rulings from the Speaker and from, uh, from other speakers across the, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, but in this case, uh, I believe that misleading information occupies a slightly different category. And uh, it creates a situation that I believe, I would argue, is, is, is even more dangerous uh, in order to, uh, to fulfill our duties as legislators and uh, the expectation that as I occupy my seat in the legislature that I uh, ask the kind of questions that are relevant and uh, would be appreciated by those who are most concerned about their future and about what's coming uh, here in this province. So I believe while it, you could argue, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that it's a weaker test, uh, I also do, do believe that it's one that nonetheless infringes on my ability to do uh, my job. And then it almost goes without saying at that point, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that this provision of the false information that is being given uh, is a case where false information misleads a member and that member then is unable to fulfill their duty fulfill their obligation to their constituents and to the people of Manitoba in our role in the uh, official opposition. Uh, so if it's been established, and this is again what we hope uh, you take on, uh, under consideration uh, here this afternoon, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that, if, uh, that it, if it is in fact established that false information has been put on the record in this House, then this would impede a member in their duty and that would be a clear prima facie case that we could uh, then uh, consider as a matter of privilege. In, in this instance, and this is the heart of the, uh, the issue that I bring forward, the failure of the government to update uh, both producers and uh, those working with regards to uh, flood mitigation uh, through this House, through committee, through any of the many tools that this government has at its disposal to disperse information. At this point, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at a time where we see uh, the actions in the Legislative Assembly being less important than the information that's being given to the public directly through public health officials, I think has put a fine point on the, uh, the importance of uh, disseminating the information in any means necessary, especially when we're talking about emergency uh, scenarios. I think it's, it's very clear that the government has a number of tools at its disposal uh, the ability to uh, execute and, uh, a plan and to communicate that plan in, uh, in a way that I think 
uh, gets to the public in the fastest way. We certainly know in today's world where uh, we have social media, we have access to uh, instant communications, and again, this is the uh, this is the entire government, the department, in this case of infrastructure, any uh, department which is affected would be able to give this information in a, a lightning speed way and in a way that doesn't uh, simply uh, rely on the functioning of the legislature. Uh, you know, it's been suggested a few times by the member for uh, River Heights that uh, we should get to question period. Well, I, you know, I would argue and I think most members would agree that question period certainly is an answer period. Uh, we, uh, at the best of times, don't get answers in this place. And, uh, you know, to suggest that that's the only way that members can get information in this place is ludicrous. And uh, I think that it's certainly most important for the public to hear the facts and not uh, facts that, that certainly mislead them, which again is the, the point that I'm making here today. So once again, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the uh, evidence that I have should be put on the record, should be stated very clearly. And what, uh, what the heart of this matter is, is the um, information that has been released by this government with regards to what is again termed strategic infrastructure. Uh, and what it, this uh, particular matter of privilege is about is how that strategic infrastructure has been counted, has been, uh, has been uh, uh, accounted in terms of the, uh, the internal uh, accounting within the government, but then most importantly how that information has been disseminated to the public. By doing this, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we believe that they have misled Manitobans and uh, they have uh, misled uh, all, uh, all of us in this chamber regarding the true nature of the government's infrastructure spending. When uh, this government, of course, was first elected, we know that uh, they indicated strategic uh, infrastructure would uh, contain several items, and I'd like to list them very quickly here uh, for you uh, today, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We know that uh, first and foremost, uh, the uh, government indicated that uh, highways and bridges would be uh, included and counted towards uh, the strategic infrastructure budget within this province. We know that they also indicated that water-related capital would be counted towards the inf strategic infrastructure uh, uh, budget within this province. Uh, parks, uh, cottages, camping, uh, all included as part of the strategic infrastructure uh, listed in this province. Uh, the Building Manitoba Fund, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, which of course we know is an important uh, fund that uh, we know that uh, capital uh, grants that are offered through that program are uh, vitally important to building uh, our, our province. Um, maintenance and preservation on our highways uh, is uh, one of the items that was listed as being counted towards the strategic infrastructure budget uh, in this province. Uh, included in that, of course, uh, we know that maintenance and uh, preservation with regards to water infrastructure and water strategic water infrastructure uh, projects here in this province were to be included. And, and again, that speaks very much to, uh, to my point that here today. Uh, in addition, and there are just a, just a couple of more, uh, but they are significant. And this is the health uh, capital spending uh, that is uh, supposed to be included or was uh, listed as being part of the strategic infrastructure budget uh, by this government. Uh, the education uh, uh, infrastructure budget to be included as strategic infrastructure. Housing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and of course Northern Affairs and the work that's done in those communities. So as you can see, that's a, a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items uh, within this government uh, that uh, I would suggest uh, make up uh, the bulk of this government's um, uh, work within uh, uh, the infrastructure space. 
uh, that was what was, con what was considered as or listed as part of the strategic infrastructure. And, and again, we could pick each one of those apart. For instance, and I'm just picking this one, but parks, cottages, and camping. Well, you know, I'm, I'm as my uh, colleague from St. John's knows, I'm, you know, I like to spend as much time outdoors as I can. I certainly appreciate our provincial parks and, uh, and uh, enjoy going camping when I can. There are certainly an infrastructure component to those, uh, but to list that as part of what we would call strategic infrastructure uh, might be a bit of a stretch for uh, some who are understanding what uh, the strategy behind that strategic infrastructure might actually be. So those were the, uh, did I say 10? Yeah. 10 uh, items that were initially um, uh, indicated by this government as strategic infrastructure. And, uh, and that was when this government was first elected. However, and this is uh, where it becomes very important that uh, members of this chamber understand how this information can be mis particularly misleading. Uh, what we saw in the, uh, the next year, the next budget year, we understand that there were additions to that 10, um, the, those 10 items, and there were some items that were uh, left out, unfortunately. So these are the items that were included in that next year's budget. Highway, in, highways infrastructure and airport runway capital, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the um, uh, transportation equipment and aircraft were included as part of strategic infrastructure. The uh, maintenance and preservation of highways, as, as it should be, was uh, considered strategic infrastructure once again. Uh, Water-related infrastructure, and this was an expanded uh, scope of that particular uh, area that uh, the government was now including as part of the strategic infrastructure budget that it was willing to, uh, to bring forward here in the province. Again, maintenance and preservation uh, of water infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, health uh, was once again included, education, housing, but included on top of those was, uh, was also municipal and local infrastructure. Now this, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you've had a chance to look at the budget, uh, includes a, a much expanded definition of strategic infrastructure than was originally uh, mentioned. And uh, in particular, this would be a, a large portion of the provincial budget when including those municipal and local infrastructure projects. Uh, likewise, public service buildings, uh, equipment and technology was also included. Uh, again, technology was included as a strategic infrastructure uh, priority. And parks, cottage and camping once again was also included as strategic infrastructure. So what the, uh, the government managed to do in this case was set out a list of priorities for strategic infrastructure that then morphed within one year of being elected where they added airport runway capital, they added highway maintenance, transportation and equipment and included in that the aircraft owned and operated by the, uh, the province they included public service buildings, they included equipment, and again, they included technology. So there was a, a much broader uh, definition of what was called strategic infrastructure. I would say not only are we questioning the, uh, the word strategic in this case, but maybe even questioning the word infrastructure. Uh, but certainly that would be uh, for a debate for another day. Uh, what, what was also then done, not only were those added and an expanded definition added, but also the government within that first budget year managed to remove uh, bridges, maintenance and preservation of water assets, and they also removed uh, capital investments in Northern Affairs communities. So that was within that first year, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. However, they, they weren't done yet. 
because if we look at what they call their mid-year financial report and then look at uh, the third quarter financial report from this year, once again, the parameters have changed. And once again, this government's definition of what's called strategic infrastructure has completely changed. And now, in this case, it only includes four categories. And those include roads, the highways in this province, uh, bridges, and what's now being termed flood protection. Uh, it includes health, education, and housing. There's a, a nebulous definition of other provincial infrastructure, which is uh, which has yet, yet to be parsed exactly what that means, uh, but, uh, but it's sort of a catch-all category, which may include some of the items that were initially ind indicated as being part of uh, strategic inf infrastructure, or may include some of the items that were included in the, uh, in the budget the following year right. that, that were given. So we're actually operating with three different categories or three different instances in time that we're not sure which one the category, which category these, uh, these items fit into or if they do at all. And then on top of that, uh, to, if, you, if you can believe it, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries was now added as a fourth category that, um, uh, again, I, you know, from, we, from what we can understand, does not include any of the other uh, strategic infrastructure categories that could possibly be fitting within that. So again, this is additional uh, uh, portions of the budget which are now being uh, tied to what's called strategic inf infrastructure. So many of the categories are missing and the Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries is a completely new addition within the uh, just the last, uh, the last uh, year. So we, we understand why this is being done, but what is impeding my work as a legislator and what is impeding my ability to uh, perform my duties on behalf of my constituents and of the people of Manitoba is that this government is changing what the definition of a uh, strategic infrastructure investment is uh, midway through uh, a budgeting year. So the, in, in one instance, they can cut uh, the spending, uh, they can underspend in others, they can uh, maybe increase an amount uh, in what you know, most reasonable Manitobans would not consider strategic infrastructure, but use that to, uh, to simply play a shell game uh, in order to move the money around, to indicate, oh, well, spending is on track, uh, or to say, oh, well, you know, as they often do, well, the cuts aren't that bad. Uh, don't worry, we know we're cutting, but, it, you know, it's not that bad. Don't worry, tell your constituents, to, you know, don't, not to worry, it's not that bad. Um, you know, uh, th this could be the message that we're getting. But instead, uh, we can't even, uh, you know, pinpoint, we can't even get a, a, a snapshot of what that strategic infrastructure is. And so in my role as the uh, infrastructure critic for the official opposition, it, and I would argue in the, in the role that every member of this chamber on the opposition benches has to their constituents, because uh, you know, I look over at my friend from Union Station, and I know when they say uh, you know, capital within the healthcare uh, department is an important aspect that we need to be considering, uh, you know, it is impossible for us to actually parse, you know, is that part of the strategic infrastructure? What part of the healthcare capital spending is part of that strategic infrastructure spending? And how can we uh, then uh, report to our constituents, to our stakeholders, and to Manitobans what the real picture is that we're dealing with? Um, again, I'm looking at uh, my, uh, my colleague from Point Douglas. And I know that if she's looking at, you know, how the healthcare uh, capital spending, especially in an important uh, area like addictions, uh, might impact her constituents or the people of Manitoba and her role as our mental health and addictions uh, critic, uh, how is she then able to report that to her constituents and to the people of Manitoba, whether spending has gone up, whether it's gone down, whether it's been cut, whether it's been frozen. And we don't know that because it's being lumped into a larger category and then su into subcategories that are consistently changing and evolving 
which isn't helpful for, uh, for uh, any of us here in uh, this chamber. I know um, my friend from uh, Kuwaitnuk uh, has been doing incredible work on behalf of his uh, constituents as well. And uh, I know that he has a lot of questions uh, with regards to uh, the people in his constituency and how they might understand the capital spending that's being done, not just in his area, but I would argue, and, and he sits as part of a, a Northern Caucus that takes the concerns of Northern Manitobans very seriously. And uh, they have you know, major strategic uh, infrastructure deficits, uh, you know, and at the same time as the government is selling off uh, you know, strategic order. Uh, I just want to remind the member from Cor Concordia if you can speak through the speaker um, and chair. Um, it seems like the discussion is going, I can't I hear you from um, having your back towards me. The other member for Concordia. You know, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, once again, it is, uh, I appreciate your guidance because I get so off track when I get, you know, uh, heckled by, uh, by any member in this chamber. Uh, I sometimes turn and I want to address them directly, but I know, in fact, that I should be uh, uh, directing my comments to you. Now, I notice that we've had some members from the uh, government benches speak up, and I, I do believe that they're also wondering about the strategic infrastructure in their own constituencies. They're saying, is that bridge uh, that needs to be uh, rebuilt in my constituency, is that now considered strategic infrastructure? And I'm sure the minister has said, no, that's now been removed from that list. And then maybe six months later, it'll be back on the list. Regardless, the work isn't being done, the investments aren't being made. And I know that members on the backbench are certainly making that uh, known here in the chamber today. And I, I encourage them to con continue that advocacy uh, in the caucus room and for those that are at the cabinet table to continue to bring that message forward to their premier who's uh, ignoring the uh, real concerns of their constituents. But, you know, instead they uh, simply chirp from the back benches and, uh, you know, simply don't stand up for members of their own constituency when it comes to uh, uh, even, uh, you know, issues like the, uh, the Dauphin Jail and how that affects the parkland. And we wonder uh, why aren't members standing up? Why aren't they making more noise about that? Is that now concluded as part of strategic infrastructure? We've heard that parks and uh, and order. Uh, order. I just want um, the greatest respect that the members should be focusing on how the privilege of how, um, their privilege house has been breached. Privileges such as freedom of speech, freedom of arrest in civil action, exemption from jury duty, freedom from obstruction or intimidation. We're dealing with the rights of House as a collective, including the regulations of inter internal affairs of the House, the authority to maintain the attendance and service of the members, the power of discipline, the rights of institute requires, inquiries, and to call witnesses and demand papers, the rights to administer oaths of witnesses, and the rights to publish papers. These are what should be raised when trying to prove the prima facie breach of privilege has occurred rather than debating policy issues. The other member for Concordia. Once again, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, your guidance is very much welcomed and, uh, and I do have prepared notes that I, I do try to, uh, to adhere to. I, you know, I get off track when I'm heckled and I know that the, uh, the member, the Minister for, uh, for Conservation is asking why parks, cottage and camping was dropped from the strategic infrastructure budget and uh, I would imagine she's probably asking the same questions I am. So if we do have time, I would imagine that after I'm done my matter of privilege, she'd be happy to get up and she can uh, ask that same question and maybe the Premier, Order. maybe other members could uh, actually uh, give us some information here in the House but uh, certainly we're not seeing it in Order. the official documents that have been so far tabled here in this house. Again, uh, my apologies, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I get heckled. I'm like, uh, I'm like a cat with a ball of yarn. I get off track very easily. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I just I constantly want to, uh, you know, answer and, and speak to the, the concerns that the backbench is having because they're not, the government side is just, they want to ask these questions too and they're being muzzled every single day. They certainly feel that the matter of privilege uh, would probably apply to their situation as well. I can feel their pain, but, uh, but and so I try to give them voice, but I take your uh, advice here to, uh, to stay on track, to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm adhering to your, your, your expert guidance. So this is the concern that I have, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and this is uh, where I believe that a particular matter of privilege that I have 
uh, is, uh, is, is actually very relevant and very important, and I do believe it is something that I, I'm sure you'll want to uh, rule on here today once you hear all the facts and you know uh, everything that uh, members of, of, of this House have to say about it. So what the argument is, is that because uh, of these, um, uh, this misinformation that has been put on the record, this uh, misdirection and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a, a, a litany of information that not only uh, is wrong and is factually incorrect, it is unfortunately misleading. And this is where the matter of privilege uh, is really uh, key to understand that uh, this misleading information is what is making my job as a legislator uh, more, not only more difficult to do, but I would argue impossible to do and therefore constitutes a very serious breach of our, our rules here in this House and uh, is uh, therefore warranted as a, uh, uh, to be brought forward as a matter of privilege. These uh, particular cuts that we've seen, whether again, whether they're a cut or whether they're being uh, underspent within the budget, uh, is uh, completely impossible to discern under the, uh, under the category of strategic infrastructure because those uh, particular uh, categories that have been put forth by the government are shifting so quickly. And uh, we know that some have been dropped. We know that the Department of Conservation has apparently been dropped from that. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries has been brought into that category. We know that uh, health, education and housing was originally uh, stated within that category and now potentially is not, uh, it doesn't include all of the items uh, within that department that uh, the folks would understand to be strategic infrastructure. We know that there's a catch-all. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, other provincial infrastructure. Then maybe the uh, the members opposite uh, a particular bridge that I heard him asking about might be included in that, but we don't know. We don't hear if that's uh, included in that catch-all term. We don't know if the Dauphin Jail uh, was originally a part of that strategic infrastructure was dropped. Well, you know, when a healing centre was proposed, whether that was dropped and cut, like everything else that this government uh, is cutting. So we don't know, and that I equates to what's uh, ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars less uh, that is on the table. And when we're talking about uh, such a key a discussion point for the legislature, it was certainly a key discussion point uh, during the uh, election campaign, I know I knocked on uh, several uh, uh, several doors. Well, <laughs> knocked on a lot of doors, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I knocked on several doors where uh, you know people indicated. Well, they said, you know, I we're concerned my roads aren't being fixed. I'm concerned that the highways within this province aren't being fixed. And so they asked me, so why is that not being done? Was that not something that the government said they were going to prioritize? And they said, uh, and I had to tell them, no, they, they in fact reneged on their, their commitment in the, fr in the 2016 election. But beyond that, now Order. we can say that... With the respect, um, I have to ask the member to deal with um, whether the prima facie case here has noted uh, is getting into a debate of po policy issues and strain from the established prima facie case. I would re remind the member again that please um, provide us with the parliamentary, parliamentary privilege as was previously outlined. The Honourable Member from Concordia. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and ex exactly, uh, I will definitely take your advice with regards to that because I think that is the, uh, the, the most key point that we do need to uh, focus on here. Um, so, again, what, when we talk about what the, uh, what the information that was uh, dis uh, disseminated originally by the government, uh, we understand kind of the context within that, that what, how that was, uh, was framed. What we don't know and what is then intentionally misleading and in this case impeding on my ability as a legislator to uh, ask proper questions, to, uh, to probe and to dig into uh, specific budget items is the fact that hundreds of millions of dollars less has been spent. We know that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's been verified by the federal uh, parliamentary budget officer who shows that Manitoba's per capita infrastructure has fallen to one of the lowest here in, uh, in Manitoba uh, across the entire country. Uh, we know that this to be the case, and yet because 
those, of those shifting parameters, of those differing categories, it's impossible for uh, myself to ask about uh, you know, issues that are capital projects that are related to my constituency or, or in this case related to infrastructure as my role I as critic for infrastructure. Uh, it's impossible for me to understand how municipal and local infrastructure could be included in one update and then dropped in the next. And it impedes my ability then to ask those questions. And I simply want to put on the record once again that every single member of this opposition likewise would like to be able to ask those important questions. Uh, I, maybe there's members uh, in the back bench who also want to do that, even ministers maybe, who are wondering why was my department cut so drastically, but uh, we will leave that for another day. At the very least, I can say with certainty that members on this side of the House are Order. most interested in asking those, those questions. So what I would like to do then, um, Mr. Deputy <laughs> Speaker, is uh, I would like to uh, move. Order, order. The honourable member for Concordia. Order. You know, it's. Uh, the honourable member for Concordia. I, as I said, I mean, I know that members have uh, concerns. They're being very vocal right now. I hope they make those concerns known around the cabinet table. I hope they make those concerns known around the, cons the uh, uh, caucus table. They, they certainly don't make it known in the public, but I do hope that they're making those concerns known uh, behind the scenes. But what I would like to do, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at your guidance, of course, is to, uh, to move this uh, most important uh, matter of privilege. And this is uh, the, and I will get specific about what that is at this point. Uh, so my matter of privilege is uh, the statement of the government's programs and its intentions obscures the actual activities of the Palestine government, and in doing so, it undermines my ability to hold the government to account. It is a breach of my privilege, and so I move, seconded by the member for St. John's. I'd be very happy to have uh, the member for St. John's second my motion. Uh, that this matter be referred to a committee of this House. <clears throat> Uh, before we recognize any other members to speak, I would remind the House that remarks at this time by honorable members are limited to strictly relevant comments, but whether, whether or the alleged matter of privilege has been raised at the earliest opportunity and whether the prima facie case has been established. The honorable member for Tyndall Park. Speaker, as Deputy House Leader, I'm responding to the member for Concordia's matter of privilege. This is not the first opportunity this member could have brought forward this matter, and this member has not demonstrated that this is a prima facie case. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's frustrating and quite, it's, it, and frankly, it's quite disgusting how much the NDP are choosing to obstruct the House proceedings during a pandemic, not to mention the amount of money, the amount of time, the amount of resources, all of our staff here at the Legislature coming into the bill building every single day. These are thousands and thousands of dollars being spent every day here in the province of Manitoba to literally listen to the NDP waste time. This money in a time of pandemic could be going towards, for example, our daycares, where we know the money should be going, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And you know, the newer NDP members, they have this wonderful opportunity Order. right now. They could come forward and band together and be a good NDP party, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but they're choosing not to, and it is disgusting. It is disgraceful. We as representatives need to be debating COVID-19 immediately. Order. We need to be sharing information with Manitobans. We need to be gaining and spreading education about the virus. And we need to be debating what to do here in our province. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the only way we can do this is if the NDP stopped obstructing the House proceedings here in the chambers. The Honourable Government House Leader. I would only say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that that is one of the finest speeches I've ever heard a member deliver in this House, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A matter of privilege is a serious concern. I will, I'm going to take this uh, matter under advisement to consult with the authorities and will return to the House with a ruling. 
Uh, the Honourable uh, Government House Leader on House Business. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on House Business, I'd like to announce that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts is scheduled to meet in camera tomorrow, March 18, 2020, at 6 p.m. is cancelled. On House Business, it was um, announced that by the Honourable Government House Leader that um, the Standing Committee of Public Accounts scheduled to meet in camera tomorrow, March 18, 2020, at 6 p.m., is now cancelled. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and we've heard a lot of... Uh, on a... On a matter of privilege. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon on a matter of privilege. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, sorry for that little mix-up. I think uh, we've heard a lot, you know, from this government about, about how bad we are for doing this, but, but really, what, what we have Order. to take into account, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is really how bad the government is and how bad they want to be. You know, we, we know we're in the middle of a, a coronavirus outbreak, uh, and yet we uh, know that this government's cuts to health care have, have been detrimental to the well-being of Manitobans on a good day, never mind while this, this outbreak is on, and perhaps if they hadn't have mistreated so many public sector workers, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they wouldn't find that the nursing staff is, is burnt out, that nurses retired because they couldn't take what this government was doing to them anymore, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You know, it, it, it's a sad commentary when this government won't admit that some of their own laws that they passed are part of the problem with what's going on today, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Part of their whole concept of, of cutting, cutting spending at any cost, that, that's really what they've been about and the only thing that, that they've been about, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is about the money. Well, all of a sudden, it seems that maybe they should have been focused on the care of Manitobans. As we witness Manitobans scramble for supplies and, and good for all of us in this chamber that we all banded together to do the right thing to make sure that the government ordered those, those emergency supplies that they needed. Now, imagine, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you will, if they hadn't cut back so much, maybe some of those supplies would already be here. They'd already be in the system. Oh, Order. my goodness. That got them going. Order. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, we, we've seen the cuts, and, and you know, for so long we've, we've listened to nurses say that they're burnt out, that that they can't take much more, and then all of a sudden we throw this COVID virus at them and say, well, please take more. And you know what, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a lot of those nurses that retired before they really wanted to, a lot of them that, that just quit, went away, have agreed to come back. Because they actually do something that, that this government doesn't. They actually care about people, and they care about people's well-being and they care about people getting the care that they need, it's too bad that members opposite to form this government don't share that same caring and compassion that, that our frontline workers. And I'm not going to talk just about the nurses, although they certainly are our front and center, but Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's, it's all those frontline workers that, that we need to focus on at this point in time, and it's all of them that we need to hope that they can get through this with the cuts that have taken place and with the restrictions that have been put on them. You know, whether it's, it's somebody phoning for an answer, but there's nobody at the end of the line to answer. And, and Order. I just want to remind the member that um, he has to identify what the um, the, the matter, matter of privilege is, um, he's going into debating, and if he would continue going on to his point of privilege, um, the Honourable Member for Flin Flon. 
for that, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and I am getting to the meat of the matter, if you will, on what the matter of privilege is. But uh, what I've learned from previous rulings from the Speaker when it came to things like matters of privilege is, is that she rightfully ruled that, that the way the case was presented at the time didn't supply enough detail for the speaker to be able to rule sufficiently on, on, on why the matter of privilege was, was in fact a matter of privilege. So if, if you'll bear with me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on why I'm laying out, and sometimes it, it takes more time than perhaps we'd like to lay out that case, but we need to make sure that we get the facts on the record so that so that you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can actually make a ruling based on those facts. So, so all of the things that I've talked about so far are part of the facts related to how this matter of privilege and what the government has done affects my ability in this chamber and, and it really and truly affects every one of us and our ability in this chamber. And, and so really, I, I, I'm going to get into to more of the crux of the matter here. We, we really, what we're talking about is, is their unconstitutional Bill 28, probably illegal Bill 28. So that, that's really the issue at hand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it really is, is the importance of how it affects my ability as a member of the opposition, how it affects each and every one of us in our ability to do our jobs. So, you know, there, there's great debate and, and we'll spend a little bit of time now and probably more a little later on talking about the earliest opportunity to present this matter of privilege. So, so I, I believe the phrase earliest opportunity must be understood in a more reasonable sense then, then sometimes what we take to mean you have to bring it up right, look at the split right now, the earliest opportunity cannot simply mean the next moment in time in which a member has the ability to speak. This, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is really much too simple of a, of a, of a definition of earliest opportunity and it's one which I'm sure you'd agree we, we cannot just ascribe to that we really need to look at more of, of what, what the definition of earliest opportunity really means. So rather, it, it must, this, this earliest opportunity must be understood in a holistic and uh, cont <clears throat> excuse me, contextual manner. This, uh, holism and contextualism will allow for members to consult the relevant authorities, speak with or study various experts on the, the matter as the case may well may uh, be as well a review of the evidence that has been compiled on the matter at hand. So we need to really understand that whole concept, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, to, to really get the concept of, of what earliest opportunity, in fact, means in, in, the, in the realm of reality, as opposed to sometimes just the very stilted view that we, we tend to think of earliest opportunity to mean. So hopefully, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we can expound on that a little more. Uh, as to the test of privilege, really, uh, if you'll bear with me, this is really where some of the, the time has been spent to, to really research to make sure that the facts get put on the record as to how it has impacted my uh, privilege as a member of this chamber. So, you know, that, that gets to the earliest comment and, and earliest opportunity because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is a lot of factual background information 
particularly in this particular matter of privilege, there's possibly more background in information that needs to be explored than, than what we've seen in, in some other cases that have been presented. So I'll, I'll attempt to go through that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in as clear and a concise uh, manner as possible. But it, but it does take some time to, to lay those facts out. So, um, so to start with, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I refer to House of Commons Procedure and Practice Second Edition, commonly known as O'Brien and Bosque, for guidance on this difficult question. Now, I know the members opposite and, and, and yourself, Mr. Deputy Speaker, have heard some references to this with other matters of privilege, but we need to, with each matter of privilege, in order for them to be taken by themselves, which, which in order for you to do your job as speaker, they have to be taken by themselves on the facts of that individual matter of privilege. They can't just be taken as a whole. So just saying it once with a matter of privilege once upon a time doesn't, doesn't count for entering those facts for this specific matter of privilege. So again, if you'll, you'll bear with me, uh, I'll uh, get into some more of that. So on page 11 of this uh, 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 House of Commons Procedure and Practice Second Edition, uh, on page 111, O'Brien and Bosk write, and I quote here, a member may also be obstructed or interfered with in the performance of his or her parliamentary functions by non-physical means. In ruling on such matters, the speaker examines the effect of the incident or event had on the member's ability to fulfill their, excuse me, to directly quote here, uh, uh, had on the member's ability to fulfill his or her parliamentary responsibility and just a momentary end quote, that, that's a direct quote. It's not necessarily the language that we would use today to, to refer to people, but unfortunately that is the language that, that I'm forced to quote here, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, so, uh, so we have to look at the effect the incident or event had on the member's ability to fulfill his or her parliamentary duty. Uh, so now to get back to uh, Quoting what was said again in, in the House of Commons Procedure and Practice, second edition, page 111. Uh, if, in the Speaker's view, the member was not obstructed in the performance of his or her parliamentary duties and functions, then a prima facie breach of privilege cannot be found. That is from page 11 of O'Brien and Boss, which is the undisputed source of information regarding the appropriate way in which we ought to understand parliamentary privilege in this House, as well as in House across this country. So, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, several comments regarding the comments are in order. The Speaker's view of the matter is clearly of the utmost importance, and I think we all recognize that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that that we, we, uh, we understand the importance of the role that, that you fulfill as Deputy Speaker and we understand the importance of, of your role in ruling on these type of matters and, and it, it, it can only assist you in making those very important rulings if we enter all the facts that we believe are pertinent to the particular matter at hand into the record which is what I'm attempting to do here now, again, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, now where was I? Let's see. Um, several uh, comments regarding the comments. The Speaker's view on the matter is clearly the utmost importance. But more importantly, now this is, this is interesting, more importantly, recognizing the, the importance of the Speaker's view of the matter, but more importantly, to quote, interference should not be construed in narrow, narrowly physical terms. Interference as understood in a discussion of privilege or contempt will go beyond the mere interference, say of a member's ability to enter this house. <coughs> so 
just, just to be clear, to quote, interference as understood in a discussion of privilege or contempt will go beyond the mere interference, say, of a member's ability to enter this house. Rather, it will extend to any matter which impedes a member's ability to do their job. And this type of interference is one that cannot be fully enumerated in advance. As O'Brien and Bosch note, and, and I quote here, it is impossible to codify all incidents which might be interpreted as matters of obstruction, interference, or intimidation, and as such, constitute prima facie cases of privilege. However, some matters found to be prima facie include the damaging of a member's reputation, the usurpation of the title of a member of parliament, the intimidation of members and their staff, and of witnesses before committees. Hmm and the provision of misleading information. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that, that's really quite an important point, the, the, the provision of misleading information. We see that so often with, when we ask questions in the House that the answers we get are, don't necessarily fit with the reality of, of the question that was asked. So, I, I, I want to emphasize that last point again. The most important authorities, arguably, arguably apart from the Supreme Court of Canada, hold that the provision of misleading information constitutes a breach of privileges of the members of this House. And it is clear that this government its premier and its ministers are guilty of the provision of such misleading information. It must be noted that information which is misleading is not the same as false information, and that, that's a critical point that I, I want you to take into account as we proceed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is misleading information is not the same as false information. So, um, the standard definition of misleading is that a statement or assertion gives the wrong idea or impression. However, it is clear that the partial presentation of information, which on its own is not incorrect, but nonetheless give the wrong idea to a reasonable observer. And that this really bears repeating. The standard of the interference of a member's ability to do her job, his job, their job, does not require them to show that the government provided false information. It only requires them to show that they provided misleading information. So those, those are critical points of this uh, matter of privilege, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is we're not talking about out-and-out -out falsehoods. We're merely talking about how the information has been presented that, that leads to the false impression, the false sense of what's really taking place. And you know, we've talked about this any number of times that with different items that have come up that, that really the information that the, the government provides seems to be somewhat twisted and, and backwards and we, we've talked about the, the, the book 1984 in the past, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and we seem to live in that kind of world sometimes when this government speaks that really say something that we could accuse them of, of falsehood, but wait a minute, what exactly is it that they did say? Where did that lead us? Where did, where did the thought process take us? That, and that, that, that's the crux of the matter, right? Is, is, 
for this part. It, it, it's, it's how the information is given. And so, uh, so when we get to the, the, the point of, of, of deciding false information versus only misleading information, this is a, it's a weaker test, Mr. S Deputy Speaker. It's a weaker test than out-and-out -out falsehood, but, but nonetheless, nonetheless, it infringes on the ability of a member, such as myself, to do my job. And, and really, that, that's the meat and potatoes, right? Is, is the, 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 the matter of privilege is about how it impinges my rights as a member and really, that's, that's where we're getting to, is, is not false information, merely mis misleading information, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, thus, it, it, it follows then that if it is established that false information has been put on the record in this House, then this will impede a member in their duty. So in this instance, the failure of the government to update producers of this and this house as they promised with regard to Crown. Well, apparently my note writers need to, to get their cut and paste skills down a little better, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So really, where we're going is, is what this government has done with, with Bill 28 and how it impacts my ability as a member. So, what evidence is there, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Well, I will attempt to lay out that ev evidence now as, as we've gotten through some of the drier passages of, of, of what passages of, of, of O'Brien and Boss, for example, need to be reviewed in this case, so now we'll get more to the actual evidence of, of what, what the, the matter at hand really is. So, the Premier, the Premier of Manitoba, the Premier of this House, the, the supposed leader of Manitoba, has attempted to pass legislation but not proclaim it. At the same time that, that he's done this, that this government really has done this, is, is they've attempted to enforce legislation that has not been passed, that has not been proclaimed, sorry, it has been passed, but it's never been proclaimed. So they've attempted to enforce legislation without the proper due authorization of this House. And I refer to Bill 28 again, which is unconstitutional and which freezes the wages of over 100,000 working people in this province. And really, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that's 100,000 of people on the front lines that are there to work for Manitobans, and, and it's become even more critical now as, as we see what's happening with COVID-19, that those frontline workers need to be in place, and they need to be respected. And really, that's, that's what's missing with this government's treatment of them by not passing this bill. I just want to remind the member um, that uh, respect um, that focusing on the uh, privilege of this house is the breach of contract. Um, there was a breach of uh, privilege here, and I just want to remind the member that um, we should be concentrating on if there's a breach here, a privilege should be on freedom of speech, the freedom of arrest of a civil action, exemption of jury duty, freedom of obstruction or intimidation or dealing with the rights of the House of Collective, including the regulation of internal affairs of the House, the authority to maintain the, the attendance of service of its members, the power to discipline, the right to institute inquiries and to call witnesses or demand papers, 
the right for administrator oaths to witnesses, and the rights to publish papers. These are the uh, I, I, are examples of um, matter of privileges, and I just want to remind the member if he can keep, keep on the um, on the issue of the matter of privilege and, and not go in, into debating. The other member for Flint Fawn. Thank you for your guidance on that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I certainly will attempt to, to do that. Sometimes, as we've seen numerous times on both sides of the House, it, it, it's hard to, to, to not vector off back into that debate because it, it's something that we're so passionately bought into that, 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 that really that is how it affects our ability in this, in this chamber. That's how it in, in, in impacts our ability as legislators. So by the Premier trying to enforce this legislation without allowing the democratic rights of working people to be respected. So what is the object of this legislation? And I think it, it, it's very instructive to refer to the recent decision of the Court of Queen's Bench uh, that, uh, of Manitoba that dealt with the question of the constitutional status of the right to collectively bargain. The court wrote, and I quote here, the Ontario Court of Appeal and Professional Institute of Public Service of Canada upheld the constitutionality of the ERA. The court dealt with the substantial interference, interference test, stating at paragraphs 44, 45, 52, 54, and 56. 44, under the substantial interference test, the question is whether the process of voluntarily good faith collective bargaining between employees and employer has been or is likely to be significantly and adversely impacted. BC Health Services at paragraph 92. In each case, the inquiry is contextual and fact specific. BC Health Services at paragraph 92. Uh, so 45, the court explained in paragraph 93 of the BC Health Services that generally speaking, Determining whether a government measure affecting the protected process of collective bargaining amounts to substantial interference involves two inquiries. The first inquiry is into the importance of the matter affected to process of collective bargaining, and more specifically, to the capacity of union members to come together and pursue collective goals in concert. The second inquiry is to the manner in which the measure impacts on the collective right and good faith negotiations and consultation. So paragraph 52, the purpose of collective bargaining as the Supreme Court observed in BC Health Services at paragraph 19 is to permit members of labor unions to engage in association and collective bargaining on fundamental workplace issues. And again, at paragraph 87, to associate for the purposes of advancing workplace goals. Emphasis added there. So the protections include, the court noted at paragraph 90, the ability of a union to exert meaningful influence over working conditions. These statements recognize that unions aim at outcomes, at results. Collective bargaining is a means to an end, Mr. Deputy Speaker, apart from having its own virtues, of course. Paragraph 53, as I read the case law, while protection is not afforded to the fruits of bargaining, but only to the process by which they are to be negotiated, employer actions unilaterally undermining the ability of unions to bargain about significant matters are constitutionally suspect. Certain matters are by nature of their importance to the unionized employment relationship, matters central to the freedom of association. BC Health Services at paragraph 25, adversely affecting these in a material way may be constitutionally suspect, depending on the context. These matters include salary, Meredith at paragraph 27, 28, Alberta reference at page 335. Hours of work, Alberta reference at page 335. 
Job Security and Seniority BC Health Services at paragraph 130. Equitable and Humane Working Conditions, Alberta Reference at page 368. And Health and Safety Protections, Alberta Reference at page 368. So paragraph 54, the Supreme Court has also identified a number of employer actions as being constitutionally suspect for the purposes of subsection 2, subsection D. Again, depending on the context, including the following, taking important matters off the table or restricting the matters that may be discussed, BC Health Services and paragraphs 111 and 113, MPAO at paragraph 72, imposing arbitrary outcomes, MPAO at paragraph 72, unilaterally nullifying the negotiated terms, um, uh, removing the right to, no, wait a minute, um, arbitrary outcomes, unilaterally nullifying negotiated terms, BC Health Services at paragraphs 11 and 113, removing the right to strike, SFL at paragraph 54, and imposing limits on future bargaining, BC Health Services at paragraph 113. So paragraph 56. In conclusion, in applying the substantial interference test, which involves a contextual fact-specific inquiry, the court must consider the significance of the matter in issue to the collective bargaining process and the degree of interference with collective bargaining process. While bargaining outcomes are not determinative, they may be indicative of whether there has been substantial interference with the collective bargaining process. This is uh, it's quite a learning experience, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal concluded at paragraphs 175, 76, Paragraph 175 is noted, not every law or action limiting collective bargaining will result in a limit on Section 2D charter rights. The charter only prevents the government from doing something that would compromise the, the essential integrity of the process of collective bargaining. And that, that's really quite important. Compromise the essential integrity of the process of collective bargaining protected by 2D. BC Health Services at paragraph 129. Even if government action or legislation substantially touch on collective bargaining, they will not violate section 2D if they preserve a process of consultation and good faith negotiation. 176, oh, excuse me, that was BC Health Services, paragraph 94, so paragraph 196, the government engaged in permissible hard bargaining during a period of economic crisis and government austerity. And by enacting the ERA, the government capped wage increases for a limited period. The ERA did not completely prohibit any wage increase. The cap was in place for a limited period of time and limit imposed was in line with the wage increases obtained through free collective bargaining. Moreover, the appellant unions were able to make progress on matters of interest to some of the bargaining units they represented. They were still able to participate in a process of consultation and good faith negotiations. As such, neither the ERA nor the government's conduct before or after the enactment of the ERA, a limited the appealant's Section 2D rights. So this uh, is the background of the important issue before this House, whether the attempt by the government to enforce a law that has not been proclaimed infringes on the rights of members to hold the government to account insofar as brings this House into disrepute now that, that's really worth repeating there. This information that I've just entered into the record, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is really the important part of whether the attempt by the government, this government, this Pallister government, by, by their attempts
to enforce a law that has not been proclaimed, does that infringe on the rights of members, specifically myself, but also all members? Does that in, 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 infringe on the right of members to hold the government to account so far as it brings the House into disrepute? It is contemptuous behavior, Madam Speaker. And it, excuse me, it is contemptuous behavior, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that must be called out as such. And really, that, that's how it, it, it impacts my rights as a member, is how do we go about questioning the government? How do we go about holding the government to account on specifically Bill 28, when it's just kind of hanging out there in space somewhere, how do we say that, wait a minute, you're not complying with the legislation that, that you introduced and that you got passed, because how do you comply or not comply with something that in reality doesn't exist? And, and really that's, that's how this government is really the basis of how it's impacted my rights is in today's day and age, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sometimes politicians aren't held in that higher regard. And certainly it's instances... No, I, I agree with the government house leader. It's not getting better with what they're doing. It certainly is getting worse with what they're doing. You know what, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it, it's really what this government and, and what the government house leader has 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 allowed to happen while he's been a minister a minister of the crown a minister of this government it's really shame on him for sitting there and allowing this well in fact shame on all of them for sitting order, there and order. allowing this to happen uh, order 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 i just again um uh, there's getting a little bit of heckling going on here, but I do want to remind the uh, member for making sure that he is um, uh, going for prima facie here. There's a, uh, reg um, there was a, um, a, a possibly a, a lack of, um, of um, prima facie happening here, I, well, actually a prima facie issue here. And so he's going on to debating all the, t um, the, uh, the last few uh, minutes here. So I would remind the, per the member to go back to uh, back to the prima facie um, that he's wanted to talk about on the um, a matter of privilege. The honourable member for Flint Flon. To uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and again, I, I apologize if, if sometimes the heckling opposite gets my blood boiling when we look at, at what this government has done. And, and really, that's the crux of the matter here today, isn't it, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, is how have my rights as an MLA in this chamber been impacted by the actions of this government, and it's very specific to what what they've done with their Bill 28, the bill that, that so many people disagreed with right from the start. But but how do we how do we how do I how do I question the government on on their following that bill when that bill has never been proclaimed? because it really doesn't exist, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It exists somewhere in some realm that, 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 that we don't have the ability to ask in question period, well, how did you comply with this particular section? Order, order. Uh, with respect to the member, I, I would remind the member if, uh, if this, um, to make their, their case on this matter, and I would encourage them, uh, them to conclude their comments and move their motion on. Now, moving back. Thank you, member for uh, Mr. Flan. Deputy Speaker, and, I, and I'm speedily moving towards the conclusion of my comments, but it, but it really is, is my duty to make sure that, as Deputy Speaker, you understand that the actions that this government has taken or not taken have impacted my abilities, and that, that's really why I've raised this matter of privilege, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is because by their, their actions of not proclaiming a bill, it impacts my ability to question them on that bill, whether it's in the chamber or, or somewhere else. 
it, it really impacts how do I go about holding them to account for a bill that, that in essence doesn't exist, right? So it's a very complicated question. It, 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 it's really very important, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and perhaps maybe if some of them listened instead of chirping, they might actually learn something about how their government has, has impacted my rights and theirs, for that matter. So how, how can we help enforce a law? How can we question the enforcement of a law? How can we hold the government to account on the actual enforcement of that law if they don't proclaim it? And that's really the crux of the matter of how it impacts my ability as as the MLA to carry out my duties. So uh, the history of authority of the House is very clear, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Laws that have been duly passed by this House can be enforced, but not before they're duly authorized. So this law in particular, this Bill 28, it the way the government has handled it impacts my ability to do my job. Uh, I've, I've entered some of the, the, the factual references, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from various sources of, of legalities and, and sources of reference that, that we use throughout our dealings in this House. But it really comes down to the, the complicated question of, of the relationship between statutes, the Canadian Constitution, and privileges. And, and it, it's not an easy, quick snap answer, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and I'm sure the government ministers and government members opposite don't have an answer to, to this because it is very complicated. And, and I, I look forward to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, taking time to, to really come to the, the, the inevitable, if you will, conclusion that the actions of this government when it came to Bill 28 impacted my abilities to do my job. So while we've, we've entered that sometimes dry and boring information. It, it's really information that, that I'm, there may be more information out there that will help you in making that determination, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In fact, I'm sure there is and probably uh, could have uh, put a lot more on the record that, that supports the prima facie case that really there, there can't be any question just based on the information that, that has been provided the way they've handled this Bill 28, the way they haven't proclaimed it, the way this government has, has misled the House. And, and I remember back when I first started talking, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about the difference between a falsehood and a misleading statement. So, so really, it's not that the government has, has put false information on the record in this case. It's, it's that their actions led a person to believe that the law was going to be proclaimed when, in fact, the reality of the situation, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that the law never was proclaimed. In fact, it's still hanging out there, not proclaimed. So that uh, Order, I just want to remind the member he's um, going to, uh, again, you're talking um, on a, uh, how you're violated on a private facia uh, case here. Um, you're going to debate uh, over and over. You're repeating yourself. So I would, uh, I would encourage the member to conclude um, and put forward the, the motion. The Honourable Member for Flint Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I just wanted to really make sure that, that it, it was clear and not misleading on my part of, of how my rights as a member were impacted by this government's action. So I will very quickly now move towards wrapping up my 
my uh, remarks on this. It'd be easier without all the chirping in the background that interrupts one's train of thought, if you will, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, so let me just wrap up by saying uh, this law is an egregious attack on working people. It's an attack on the democratic rights of workers. It's one that has not been authorized by this House, and that, that's really the important part, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We, as members on this side, we as members in opposition, and, and certainly that includes members of the Liberal Party, even though they choose not to, to engage in, in this democratic action, they, they seem to want to support the government's bullying tactics in this case. So we as members are unable to hold the government to account and ask questions about this law because of the fact it's, it's in limbo. It's, it's held there because of this Premier's political games. This issue of attempting to enforce laws that have not been duly authorized by the legislature is of the utmost importance and must immediately be addressed as it really goes to the question of the privileges of members of this House to speak and to vote on bills before it. It really speaks to democracy and, and this government's meandering way of, of interrupting democratic actions and, and democratic will of the people by introducing a law, not proclaiming it, and yet enforcing it, stopping me as a member of the opposition from questioning what this government is doing and why they're doing it. So without further ado, I hope I've supplied you with sufficient information to rule on the prima facie case that, that really my rights have been violated, my, my ability to do my job as an MLA have been violated. This is a timely introduction of this, this matter of privilege as because this issue is still ongoing. Uh, it could be a matter tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, because there hasn't been the resolve, they have not proclaimed the bill. So therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move, seconded by the member Ron Kiewitno, that this issue be referred to an all-party committee for resolution immediately. Thank you. Before recognizing any other members to speak, I would remind the House that remarks of this time by honorable members are limited to strictly relevant comments about whether alleged matter of privilege has been raised at the earliest opportunity and whether a prima facie case has been established. The, honor, the, the Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This um, matter of privilege is as uh, a faulty as all the previous ones that have been brought forward, but since the member opposite raised it in his comments, I'm sure you'll allow me to respond. He speaks about the reputation of politicians and, and uh, how he would like to see the reputation of politicians defended, as we all would, because this is a noble profession in which we all work hard in, I would say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I think we all know that uh, the work that is done is, is important and often uh, not seen or not recognized and maybe not appreciated. But, but I would say to the member opposite that if he is looking for uh, the stature of politicians to be uh, lifted up, then he has a role to play in that as well. And that the, that the stalling, well, and, he, and I happy, I'd be happy to speak to his uh, constituents in Flin Flon and ask them whether or not during a pandemic, a time when that citizens, not just in Manitoba, but around the world were concerned and were uncertain about a number of different things. Order. Well, Order. I'm, I'm, I'm often reminded that the more they yell, the more they realize that I'm right, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because I think that they sensitively know that their constituents are disgusted by the actions that is going on in the legislature. And maybe they hope, and I'll wrap it up with this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Order. maybe they hope that people are just going to forget, Order. that they're just not going to remember. We're going to remind them every day, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Order. And I'll remind them about something else. That in the event that the budget and the budget speech are not able to be considered by the Legislative Assembly today, it will be the government's intention to bring it forward for consideration in the Legislature on Wednesday, March 18th. The Honourable Member for River Right. Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, time will tell whether the matters being raised as matters of privilege are in fact meeting the criteria, because we will, in due course, have a ruling from the Speaker. Uh, I have doubts whether this will be uh, ruled to be an appropriate matter of privilege, because there have been quite a number of other opportunities before this when this issue could have been raised. In fact, as I recall that the member has indeed raised this on previous occasions in this legislature, uh, the member is correct that Bill 28, and whether or not it's unconstitutional, is an extremely important issue. And it's an important issue for uh, all of us, for our province, and for many people who are working, because, uh, of course, it affects uh, people's income. And uh, in, in that, the uh, member is quite correct that this is an important issue. But I, I find it a little peculiar that the MLA for Flin Flon is concerned about his ability to raise questions in question period. It is most peculiar as he is obstructing his own ability to ask questions in question period. <laughs> I, I also want to uh, comment on the fact that the member for Flin Flon, uh, when he talks about uh, some of these issues, say they are very complicated. Uh, this was an excuse that uh, members of the, the NDP government used very often in answering questions when they didn't have an answer. And I think that there's a better a better approach to this, and maybe part of the member's role is to simplify it so that everyone can understand it instead of trying to make it more complicated. I, I would uh, also comment that um, we are at a critical time today. We are at a critical time in all of Manitoba, including northern Manitoba, and the potential for the coronavirus, COVID-19, to infect people in the north. And as I raised yesterday, they are concerned about what has happening at the Kiask site, where there's a lot of people gathering, I am told, considerably more than 50 at a time in crowded conditions for lunch, uh, and what will happen there. There are issues and concerns about whether the government is actually going to screen people going to remote communities like St. Teresa Point and others uh, so that it will reduce the likelihood of this uh, virus, this troublesome virus, uh, from getting into northern Manitoba. I think these are questions that should be being asked to the government and we should be demanding answers. Mr. Speaker, there is another reason why, when we look at the relative importance of matters, the matter of privilege is, of course, very important in terms of Bill 28, but the immediacy of the situation uh, of COVID-19 and how we deal with it is made even more important by uh, this material which I table so all members can have access to it. Uh, this material suggests that we may have to have measures continuing to suppress the virus, uh, if not completely all the time, at least on and off, likely until we have a vaccine, which is uh, probably going to be at least one or two years away. We don't know. Uh, although there are a lot of vaccines being worked on at the moment, we don't know 
what their efficacy is going to turn out. We have to find out whether there are uh, you know, side effects and other things. So there is a lot of work before we will actually have a vaccine. And we may have to uh, keep looking at measures in an ongoing way for quite some time. And in doing that, it is important that we have uh, that discussion. It is important that we have a view from the north as well as a view from other parts uh, of Manitoba. So uh, those are my comments on this uh, matter of privilege which has been brought forward by the member for Flint Flon. Thank you, uh, Merci Miigwech. A matter of privilege is a serious concern. I am going to take this uh, matter under advisement to consult with authorities. I will return to the House with the ruling. The Honourable Member for St. Patel. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise on a matter of privilege. A matter of privilege on the, on the, on the Honourable Member for St. Patel. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As you know, uh, a uh, matter of privileges are serious, and I'm uh, not to be taken lightly. And I'm here, and I'm raising a matter of privilege regarding this government's abuse of omnibus legislations. And as we know, uh, these types of legislations are difficult for all members to fully uh, have the time and detail to understand and to go through the details in order so that they can do their diligence in. Uh, legislation and providing the correct right number right amount of insight not only to bring towards this chamber and any committees but also back to their constituents uh, matters of privilege are to be brought forward when they demonstrate that the rights and immunities of members uh, are collectively or individually have been breached uh, since the 1960s in parliaments uh, around the world, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, we've seen uh, and analyzed an attempt to reformulate parliament privilege uh, for, the 19, uh, for the 20th century. And now in the 21st century, in Australia and in New Zealand, as recently as uh, 2014, they both, both enacted legislation uh, clarifying elements of parliamentary privilege. And while in the United Kingdom that has thus far determined that it is unnecessary at this time to try to legislate parliamentary privilege. All of these attempts to modernize uh, law of privilege reflect the change in relationship between the public and parliament. All three recognize that today public figures are accountable to the public. Uh, various commentators have also observed how the British House of Commons, since the mid 19th century, has really taken on more narrow approach to uh, parliamentary privilege and focused on the parliamentary proceedings. An expression of this shift in thinking was expressed in the 1967 report of the UK House of Commons Select Committee on Parliamentary Privilege. That committee recommended that the legislation be introduced to extend and clarify the scope of privilege and expressed in the conviction that the recognized rights and immunities of the House will and must, this is a quote, will and must be enforced by the courts as part of the law of the land, end quote. The House took note of this report, uh, but however, you know, it was not adopted. And it wasn't until about a decade later in 1977, the UK Committee of Privileges looked again at the meaning of privilege and contempted and reiterated the conclusions of that same 1967 report. Now this time, in 1977, the report was adopted by the House. And it, in it, the committee recommended, quote, recommended that the application of privilege be limited to cases of clear necessity in order to protect the House, its members, 
and its officers from being obstructed or interfered with in the performance of their functions. The set recommendations not adopted by the House were those recommending the legislat legislative changes to codify privilege. Now, it wasn't until some 20 years later, in about 1999, the Joint Committee of House of Commons and House of Lords of the UK published what has become an extremely influential report on parliamentary privilege. Even though it was not adopted by the House of Commons and no, no legislation resulted from its recommendations. Building on what has been undertaken in some you know, 30 years earlier, the report represented an ambitious, in-depth, and comprehensive study of various rights and immunities that make up parliamentary privilege, their historic origins, and their contemporary applications. Now this is relevant because it does discuss the adequacy of current understandings of the uses of parliamentary privilege and made various recommendations on how to adapt parliamentary privilege to the modern needs and realities. The committee's study was guided by the following fundamental questions. Do the law and practice of parliamentary privilege meet present and future needs? Second, do existing procedures satisfy contemporary standards of fairness and public accountability? And those two questions were fundamental in guiding the committee's study. The committee did note that there was an important need to review parliamentary privilege given several important developments. Now, these included several decisions on parliamentary privilege had been rendered by the House of Lords in the 1990s, including Pepper v. Hart and Preble v. Uh, Television New Zealand, now, both of which engaged a comprehensive analysis of parliamentary privilege. Another area which they noted was of importance was how the UK enacted the Human, I, the Human Rights Act in 1998. Now that Human Rights Act incorporated the European Convention on human rights into their own domestic law. The committee considered that some judgments of the European Court of Human Rights interpreting and applying the convention had a potential impact on parliamentary privilege. Now, one of the legacies of the committee, it's is its re-articulation of the basic proposition that necessity is the basis of all privileged claims by Parliament. This proposition has, been, has become the central feature in my analysis of parliamentary privilege, whether parliamentary studies or court judgments among the committee's recommendations. You know, like I said, among the committee's recommendations were, was this statement, that legislation be enacted to enable both houses to waive parliamentary privilege, but only where to do so would not expose a member or person making a statement or doing an act to civil or criminal liability. This would enable proceedings in Parliament to be examined by a court, but, not, but only where 
there would be no risk of liability for a parliamentarian or other person. Their other recommendation was that the legislation be enacted to define proceedings of, in Parliament to include all words spoken and acts done in course of or for the purpose of or necessi necessarily to transacting the business of either House of Parliament or of a committee. The third recommendation was that standards of procedural fairness be introduced for witnesses to parliamentary proceedings. And their other recommendation that a set of modified parliamentary privileges be codified to reflect the modern needs of Parliament. Now, the role that the 1999 UK Joint Committee report played in influencing parliamentary, governmental, and judicial thinking on parliamentary privilege was widely acknowledged. In particular, the report's recommendations have been cited in a number of leading court decisions which have articulated the scope privilege, including the Supreme Court of Canada, the judgment in Canada, that's, that's House of Commons v. Vade, and Chetor in the UK, and Gao v. Lee in New Zealand. Now, on the matter of privilege itself, the Supreme Court gives helpful guidance that we ought to consider here as to whether or not a question of privilege exists. It is important in this, it's important decision known as Vade, just as Ian Binney writing for the court found that, quote, legislative bodies created by the Act of Constitution Act in 1867 do not constitute enclaves shielded from the ordinary law of the land. The framers of the Constitution and Canadian parliamentarians in passing the Parliament Act thought it right to use the House of Commons at Westminster as the benchmark for parliamentary privilege in Canada. And so accordingly, to determine whether a privilege exists for the benefits of Senate or House of Common or their members, a court must decide whether the category and scope of the claimed privilege have been authoritatively established in relation to our own parliament or to the House of Commons at Westminster? If so, the claim to privilege ought to be accepted by the court. However, if the existence and scope of privilege have not been authoritatively established, the court will be required to test the claim against the doctrine of necessity. The foundation of all parla parla uh, parliamentary privilege. In such a case, in order to sustain a claim of privilege, the assembly or, mem or member seeking its immunity must show that the sphere of activity for which privilege is claimed is so closely and directly connected with the fulfillment by the assembly or its members of their functions as a legislative and deliberative body, including the assembly's work in holding the government to account that outside interference 
would determine the level of autonomy required to enable the Assembly and its members to do their legislative work with dignity efficiently. Now, the House of Commons procedure and practice by Marlowe and Montpetit define the privilege as rights and immunities that are deemed necessary for the House of Commons as an institution and its members as representatives of the electorate to fulfill their functions. Reference may also be made to uh, parliamentary procedures and practice in the Dominion of Canada. Now, it is, it is obvious that no legislative assembly would be able to discharge its duties with efficiency or to assure its independence and dignity unless it had adequate powers to protect itself. Protect itself and its members and its officials in exercise of their functions. The British Joint Committee report adopted a similar approach. It said, parliamentary privilege consists of the rights and immunities which the two houses of parliament and their members and officers possess, possesses to enable them to carry out their parliamentary functions effectively. Without this protection, members would be handicapped to perform their parliamentary duties and authority in, of parliament in itself in confronting the executive as a forum of, for expressing the anxieties of citizens would correspondingly be diminished. While much latitude is left to each House of Parliament, such an approach to the definition of privilege implies important limits. All of these sources point in the direction of a similar, similar conclusion. In order to sustain a claim of parliamentary privilege, the assembly or member seeking its immunity must show that the sphere of activity for the privilege is claimed is so, and is so closely and directly connected with the fulfillment by the assembly or its members of their functions as a legislative and deliberative body, including the assembly's work in holding the government to account that outside interference would undermine the level of autonomy required to enable the assembly and its members to do their work with dignity and efficiently. Now I do want to address the aspect as well and go directly to speaking of the timeliness of bringing this matter of privilege forward. We do know that earliest opportunity is what we strive for when bringing forward matters of privilege. And it's understood that earliest opportunity is both uh, is understood in its, in its common sense, but also in its sense of, um, of having the earliest opportunity once uh, more contextual analysis has been done on the specific issue on a holistic sense. Now, it is, should be allowed for members to have the opportunity to consult with relevant authorities and speak to the issue directly so that they have a full and complete understanding of the issue before they bring it to this house so that they have the opportunity to speak to it with the proper expertise. 
speaking to, on various subjects and speaking to various experts is very relevant and should be considered a central part of the term earliest opportunity. Now, a thorough review of evidence will not only determine for a particular member whether they reasonably ought to believe a matter of privilege has indeed been raised. And that is, if there is a prima facie case for believing that a member in this chamber's privilege has been breached. But it will, for, it will also form the basis of any ruling or judgment regarding that matter that the speaker and ultimately this house make. As a result, the acquisition of correct and accurate information by members must be taken into consideration in the determination as to whether or not a member has brought their concern in a timely fashion. Thus, the question of reasonableness is fully objective in the sense there is not, there is a fixed or proper amount of time for bringing forward a matter of privilege to this house. The question will depend both on objective facts as whether the information is forthcoming, is available, is comprehensive, because if a matter of privilege were brought to this house without information that was comprehensive, that was, out, that was not thorough and proper, the case for that matter of privilege would be lacking. And therefore, the phrase earliest opportunity must encompass some ability for members to have the opportunity to seek expert advice and get a full understanding to bring a case before this help. Now, neither is the question fully subjective, however. It cannot be a question of speed of each individual member or simply their willingness to expend time to investigate the matter, to determine whether a matter of privilege has been brought to this house in a timely fashion. It is properly understood as an intersubjective standard, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a standard that must reflect the true capabilities of members to acquire information and expertise and analyze issues and then bring it to the House with the demands, balancing the demands that this House may reasonably make of all its members to bring forward matters at the earliest opportunity. Now that would, now that question of timeliness is certainly then best understood as a con contextual, as I stated. Now this helps us to understand the timeliness question of the issue that I'm bringing forward today. And I do want to address that that, the mice, that really my matter comes down to the many omnibus legislations that are put forward by this government through multiple pieces of legislation simultaneously. This has been a pattern with the government of bringing forward numerous bills, numerous pieces of legislation combined in one bill which would limit my ability and every member's ability to truly digest and comprehend and ana analyze the legislation before us in this House. My abilities 
as, an, as a member here are not simply to read and understand and legislate the bills that are being brought forward in this House, but it is also to understand them and communicate them properly with my constituents and various stakeholders around this province, which I encounter. And it, it, is, and it is in that role which my privileges have been breached. In the numerous omnibus legislations that this government has brought forward in the House over the past several years, I and myself being in this position, I have seen, I have experienced many times when the lack of ability to digest the contents of a bill with a bill that is brought forward with so many aspects that are being changed. These bills are, quote, sometimes are known as the red tape bills. They're the omnibus bills that have a wide-ranging, changing effect on the way our government is run in Manitoba. They should be separated out so that they can properly be understood, analyzed, debated, properly brought to committee so that Manitobans can truly digest and understand the bills and the contents of each one of them so that they know what's going to happen and they can truly understand the effects of each individual bill instead of having an omnibus bill brought forward in this chamber. The other part that Manitobans deserve is the communication aspect. When a bill is simply called red tape bill or red tape reduction, it's an omnibus bill that truly doesn't give the correct information to the Manitoban public about the impacts that the bill will have on the everyday lives of Manitobans. Additionally, what long-lasting impacts the legislation might make. So I do want to express that we've seen this time and time again from this government. Now, it's clearly part of my uh, case that this is impeding my ability to act as a member. And we've seen that clearly it's a prima facie case as evidenced in uh, the joint, British Joint Committee report that has adopted similar approach. Now, their parliamentary privilege consists of rights and immunities which the two House of Parliament and their members and officers possess to enable them to carry out parliamentary func functions efficiently. Building on this, their reports represent an ambitious and in-depth comprehensive study of the various rights and immunities that really make up the privilege goes beyond just the immediate impact, but also the historic origins and, additionally, their contemporary applications. It is discussed the adequacy of you know, current understandings and the current uses of parliamentary privilege and made various sightings of how we could improve the understanding of a parliamentary privilege for our, our modern world. And that's what we're seeing in these increased omnibus legislations for which my privilege has been breached. Do these practices meet the needs not only of our present house, but of our future needs as a parliament and as a people and as a changing population in, in our province? And I argue that omnibus legislations do not serve the needs of Manitobans. And do existing procedures and laws satisfy contemporary standards of fairness and simple public accountability? Now, 
This is this is the ar argument. I think is the most is the most is the strongest part of this case. Is omnibus legislations fair, and is our omnibus legislations publicly accountable? And I think on both counts, no. It doesn't give the average public member the proper opportunity to communicate with their members on on the aspects of the bill because the legislations are so encompassing and their impacts might not be clear to the average Manitobans. And while I know all members in this House endeavor to communicate the purpose of legislative changes, it sometimes can be a struggle with the demands uh, that this chamber would make on any member. Now, the public accountability portion it is important for public members to understand the legislation that is being brought forward. And in doing so, the public not only should have the opportunity to hear what the legislation is about, but also to actively participate in the making of that. And our process here is to have people partake in committee by bringing forward their thoughts their objections or support for any given piece of legislation. Now, when that legislation is an omnibus bill where there are several departments or pieces of legislation that are being changed, or even dozens of pieces of legislation, departments, agencies, crown corporations that will be affected, it is not only difficult, it is near impossible for a member of the public to truly digest how this legislation will impact not only their lives today, but their family members and their community's li uh, lives uh, today, but into the future as well. And it is that aspect that makes it difficult for me and for the reason that I'm standing up here with my privilege breached with this type of bill being put forward. We see the impacts of these bills often as part of the short-term narrative of governance, often without the long-term strategic planning being put forward. Now, I will reference that the prima facie case of rights being breached is, is noted here by several other committees. And they do note that there is an important to review several important points and developments. Decisions in parliamentary privilege have been rendered in the House of Lords in the 1990s. Um, Pe uh, Pepper v. Hart uh, in New Zealand, uh, Pebble v. Television, and both of which engage in a comprehensive analysis of parliamentary privilege. In the United Kingdom, they enacted their Human Rights Act in 1998, which incorporated the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law. And that committee considered that some judgments of the European Court of Human Rights interpreted and applying the convention had a potential impact on parliamentary privilege. Now, one of the legacies of the committee is its re-articulation of the basic <clears throat> proposition that necessity is the basis for all privileges claimed by parliament. This proposition has since become the central feature in any analysis of parliamentary privilege, whether in Parliament studies or court judgments. Among the committee's recommendations were these, that legislation be enacted to enable both houses to waive parliamentary privilege, but only where to do so would not expose a member or a other person making a statement to cri criminal or civil liability. This will, would enable proceedings of Parliament to be examined by a court 
but not only where there would be no risk of liability for parliamentary for parliamentary or an, any other person. The legislation be enacted to define proceedings of Parliament to include all words spoken and acts done in the course of or for purpose of or necessarily incidental to transacting the business of either House, of Parliament, or of a committee. That standard of procedural fairness be introduced for witnesses to parliamentary proceedings, and that a set of modified parliamentary privileges be uh, included to reflect the modern needs of Parliament. And when we're looking at these omnibus legislations, we need to see how they can be adjusted for our modern, modern parliamentary system. Uh, people in Manitoba are expecting that their government works for them in the way that they expect in a modern way since we are in 2020. And we know that it is through modernizing our parliamentary proceedings that we're able to stay relevant to the people of Manitoba. Now that committee in the UK, the Joint Committee report, has played an influential role in parliamentary, in governmental, in judicial thinking on privilege. It's widely acknowledged. And in particular, the report's recommendations have been cited in a number of leading court decisions which have articulated the scope of privilege, including the Supreme Court of Canada, also in the UK and in New Zealand. Now, on the matter of privilege itself, you know, the Supreme Court does give us guidance that we ought to consider uh, here as to whether or not the question of privilege exists. And that found that legislative bodies created by the Constitution uh, do not constitute enclaves shielded from ordinary law of Canada. Uh, the framers of the Constitution and Canadian parliamentarians in passing the Parliament of Canada Act thought it right to use the House of Commons at Westminster as, the, as truly the benchmark and the standard for privilege in Canada. And so we have been using that standard for determining whether this is a matter of privilege, and I argue that it clearly demonstrates that privilege has been breached in this case. Accordingly, to determine whether privilege exists for the benefit of Senate or House of Commons or members, they must decide whether the category and scope of claim of privilege has been authoritatively established in relation to our own parliament or to the House of Commons at Westminster. And if so, that claim to privilege ought to be accepted by the court. Now, however, the, if the existence and scope of privilege have not been authoritatively established, the court would re be required to test the claim against doctrine if necessity. The foundation of all parliamentary privilege in such a case, in order to sustain a claim of privilege, the assembly or member seeking its immunity must show that, this, that the activity for which privilege is claimed is directly connected to them. And I've done that by showing that I have directly had communications about what's in various bills. How do they impact my lives as citizens in Manitoba? And the, the composition of the bills itself make it untenable for members to properly do their due diligence in communicating these bills to the average citizens. It also makes it a challenge to debate and hold proper consultation with these bills and simply object to areas where bills could be made better and to encompass more aspects which would make lives of Manitobans better. 
And in such cases, you know, these claims of privilege of the assembly or members seeking its immunity are, are there to help members find that they know that, that they can interpret bills and opposition members hold members to uh, legislation to be acu uh, sorry, accurately represent the legislation to help all Manitobans. Now, I clearly believe that uh, this bill, that these omnibus bills are not in the best interests of Manitobans. And I have uh, shown, shown and outlined that, uh, that these bills are not only making my life dip difficult, but all members' lives difficult in being able to communicate properly with how and the impacts of these omnibus legislations. Now, it, it's obvious that no legislative assembly would be able to discharge its duties uh, with efficiency or to assure its independence and dignity unless it had the adequate power to protect itself. Not only to protect itself, but protect its members, and officials, and officers of the legislative body. And I clearly am bringing this in not just as a prima facie case of breach of my rights, but also doing so in a timely manner that both outlines that, that I am bringing this at the earliest opportunity. And so before I get to uh, concluding my remarks and bring forth the motion, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will just outline uh, that I have um, certainly brought this forward at the earliest opportunity. I have, uh, you know, fully outlined that, you know, after speaking with various authorities and experts on this topic, uh, researching past practices and other jurisdictions about this type of legislation, uh, how it has impacted individuals, uh, corporations, and how it's impacted uh, people in the short term and in the long term, uh, that a course of action should be changed in our parliamentary procedures with regards to this type of legislation so that we can clearly represent the people of Manitoba better into our future. And having had the opportunity to make those consultations, to review some specific cases, and consult with experts, it's clearly obvious that this is a breach, a prima facie breach of of privilege, as well, uh, I am bringing forward it at the earliest opportunity, which again, I have argued that it is being brought forward uh, at the earliest opportunity, considering that there is a more holistic uh, sense of the term earliest opportunity. So I will actually bring forward uh, my motion. Just to clarify here, I will bring forward my motion. I just will reiterate uh, in summation that I do believe that these omnibus legislations are impacting negatively my ability and all members' ability to truly, to truly uh, do their job and uh, legislate in this House. I'm bringing forward in both in an earliest opportunity after having consulted with some experts and uh, proving that this is a prima facie case of, of breaching my privilege. I will, uh, oh, sorry, I will just say this before I conclude, um, that my evidence is as follows on the matter, that the Palestine government has used and continues to use the omnibus legislation to push through multiple pieces of legislation simultaneously. For the fourth year in a row, the Palestine government has signaled its intention to put forward to put multiple legislative changes in one omnibus bill and so-called red tape bill. 
It takes very little to understand that these bills contain major changes to environmental legislation, to financial regulation, and to labor safety standards. These are matters that should be considered in separate bills. By pushing dozens of legislative changes in one bill, it undermines by my ability as a legislator to amply consider and respond to the government's proposed legislation. And it Order. undermines- I just want to remind the member for uh, St. Patel that uh, he's repeating himself. Uh, if you can go on with the motion and uh, uh, the honorable member for St. Patel. Thank you for understanding, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm on my last uh, phrase here, so I'll just conclude that. Uh, it's right here. Um, it's right here. That it undermines my ability as a legislator to amply consider and respond to government's proposed legislation, and that it undermines the public's ability to understand the government's activities. And so I move, seconded, by the member from Concordia that this matter be referred to a committee of the legislature. Thank you. Before recognizing any other members to speak, I would remind the House that remarks at this time by honorable members are limited to strictly relevant comments about whether the alleged matter of privilege has been raised at the earliest opportunity and whether the prima facie case has been established. The honorable government house leader. Madam Speaker, again, I, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry, I uh, here, here. acknowledge that uh, this is a frivolous uh, matter of privilege as all of them have. I don't know how many times I can uh, remind the House that uh, in a time of, uh, of a pandemic, of a significant um, emergency that's happening around the world, that this is how the NDP spends their time. A new member, a new member for St. Fatal, uh, whose constituents would expect better of him, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know that the former member for St. Fatal uh, certainly wouldn't be uh, Never. participating in this kind of uh, activity. No. And uh, my guess is that the former member for St. Fatel, Colleen Mayer, is actually probably out there right now helping her friends and neighbors because that's the kind of individual she is and trying True. to ensure that they get assistance. And what a stark contrast. What a stark contrast between the current member who has nothing better to do than try to jam up the legislature and the former member for St. Fatel who's actually out there helping people, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Deputy yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, a few comments on this uh, matter of privilege. Uh, I, I want to uh, first uh, compliment the MLA on the in-depth uh, analysis that he's done on omnibus bills and on matters of privilege. Um, I uh, know that the question of omnibus bills really started under the uh, former Conservative government federally Harper, of uh, Harper, Stephen yeah. Harper. Um, but, uh, you know, there were occasions when uh, we had uh, a former NDP government which brought in a few bills which uh, uh -huh. I think probably less, would have qualified for omnibus bills. Yeah, I, uh, like I that. was looking through the bills that we have now and uh, Bill 26, uh, the Credit Unions and Case Popular Amendment Acts, is one of the longer ones at uh, something like 47 pages. But it's really focused on the credit unions and case populaires, and I'm not sure that it really qualifies as an omnibus bill at this juncture. So I, I hope in the, in the future the member can be a little clearer as to which bill he's uh, so concerned about. Uh, it's possible that he's concerned about bills which are on the order paper but haven't been tabled yet, so uh, it's very hard to judge whether they are omnibus bills uh, or not at this time. Uh, I, I share the, uh, the member's uh, concern about deceptively le le titled legislation but I would point out that it certainly happened just as often with the former NDP government as it is with this government. 
it, it seems to be a, a problem we have in this legislature. I uh, suggest that the MLA consider bringing in a bill to modernize the concept of privilege. He's done a lot of work on this, and perhaps he would consider bringing in a private member's bill uh, to see what uh, could be done and uh, what a modern uh, privilege would actually look like. I think that could be quite helpful. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, because of the concerns about you know, exactly what an omnibus bill is and uh, the uncertainty about whether this really was brought up at the earliest possible time, I'm not sure that it, it qualifies as a matter of urgent public importance. But I, I would give the member an example of uh, a matter which I think could qualify as a matter of urgent public importance, and, and that is the economic needs of Manitoba at the time of this COVID-19 virus pandemic. Um, I suggest that the government should be considering things like enhanced temporary support for precarious workers and people who are self-employed and who don't have access to EI. I suggest that the uh, government should be considering the possibility of a moratorium for, on evictions for renters. Uh, I suggest that the government should uh, consider the possibility of allowing businesses to stretch their payments, uh, particularly tax payments, uh, I suggest the government uh, should be considering things like emergency financial support for people who are quarantined or self-isolated and can't work from home. I think that these are all important measures. Uh, if they are in the budget, we'll be happy to see them, uh, but uh, we wait uh, because uh, a lot of the concern about COVID-19 came up before or after or since the uh, uh, government had prepared its budget, which we are still waiting for. Uh, so with those few remarks, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, thank you, miigwech, uh, merci. A matter of privilege is a serious concern. I'm going to take this matter under advisement and consult with the authorities. I will return to the House with a ruling. The other member for um, St. John's. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. Um, on a matter of privilege? Uh, the Honourable Member for St. John's on a matter, matter of privilege. Miigwech, Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise on a matter of privilege this afternoon. Um, in respect of the government, uh, more specifically the Pallister government, misleading Manitobans, uh, and certainly, Deputy Speaker, misleading uh, in a very uh, thoughtful, methodical way, the constituents of Dauphin, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, Dauphin Parkland region, and their plan for uh, the future of the Dauphin Correctional Centre, and uh, certainly the Pallister government's failure to consult with stakeholders, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I would have thought, Deputy Speaker, that the member for Dauphin would have uh, gotten up uh, on a matter of privilege uh, to highlight uh, his uh, own government and his own party's failure to take into account um, the uh, over 80 families uh, in Dauphin that uh, his government's uh, decision, his boss's decision, uh, had a detrimental impact on. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I would have thought that the member for Dauphin would have gotten up um, with his own matter of privilege to uh, put on the record and to, to uh, issue complaint to this House in respect of his boss's plan to move uh, folks who are in conflict with the law further and further away um, from their communities, uh, their family, and the various uh, support systems that they have in place. I would have thought that the member for Dauphin would have gotten up uh, at any time since the uh, announcement, the surprising quick announcement was made uh, to uh, 
folks in the Dauphin uh, Parkland region in respect to the decision uh, to close the Dauphin Correctional uh, Center. I would have thought that he would have gotten up in this house to speak on behalf of uh, those constituents that he represents. However, I am uh, obviously quite mistaken, uh, Deputy Speaker. So I, I will stand this afternoon and I will do his job for him in raising this matter of privilege in this House this afternoon in respect of his party, his caucus, his, his um, boss, his government's failure to consult with stakeholders on such a serious, serious matter, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, the, the background to this, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, in respect of my matter of privilege today is that we, we know a decision was um, surprisingly made to announce the closure of the Dauphin uh, Correctional uh, Center. Uh, we know that the Minister uh, of Justice and the, uh, some other of his uh, cohorts, his get-along gang, traveled to uh, Dauphin and um, at the very last minute had indicated that there would be a meeting. And we know that the Minister was not um, courageous enough, I would suppose, if we want to if we want to uh, construct it like that uh, the minister of justice wasn't courageous enough to face the very workers that he was um, impacting on with the decision to close the dauphin correctional center again as backdrop i i would Order. think that the the member for dauphin would want to get up on that but Surprisingly, uh, and maybe not so surprisingly, Deputy Speaker, the, the member for Dauphin uh, has not got up. In fact, the only time the member for Dauphin has gotten up in this House is actually to applaud the decision of his boss, of his premier, of his government and his colleagues. So uh, I, I would suggest to you, uh, Deputy Speaker, as the critic for justice, it was incredibly um, shocking and disheartening to see that such a decision was made with no consultation, uh, not even a heads up for anybody that was involved in um, this announcement and that it would affect on this announcement. Uh, Deputy Speaker, as I've shared in this House, uh, it just so happened uh, that uh, our NDP caucus was in Dauphin when that announcement was made. And I'm very proud to say that we were able to, we had already had uh, so much outreach that was set up to be able to meet uh, with Dauphin uh, citizens. Uh, and so uh, we, we actually did the government's job that day by um, comforting and trying to give uh, as much uh, security to uh, and ensure that we could. Uh, sorry, Deputy Speaker. Order. The member for Southdale keeps chirping on, and, and I just can't hear properly, Order. Madam Speaker. So, as I was saying, Deputy yeah. Speaker. Order. I just want to remind everyone for heckling. Um, I did need to uh, hear the person speaking, and um, the honourable member for um, St. John's. Which Deputy Speaker? That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. As I was saying, Deputy Speaker, our caucus, our entire NDP caucus was in Dauphin when this very uh, shocking announcement uh, was made to employees that had absolutely no clue. They had no clue. They had no time to prepare themselves. They were invited to a, a meeting at 11 o'clock and just uh, dropped the bomb on them, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, we spent the next couple of days, as I indicated, meeting with uh, Dauphin uh, Manitobans to hear their concerns, and uh, since then have um, attempted in um, the way that we are able to, as uh, opposition members, to be able to support uh, families, uh, to support uh, workers. Uh, but also to support uh, Manitobans who are in conflict with the law and find themselves um, in, a, in a tug of uh, war with uh, the Premier in his um, plan for austerity and every cut that he has made thus far. And they are now uh, being forced to go uh, further and further away from their community uh, supports and their family supports. Um, 
Uh, so, Deputy Speaker, as the critic for justice, uh, it's important that we should have had uh, some information to be able to share with uh, constituents that have uh, reached out to us in respect to this decision. Uh, I would be, I would suggest that it's fair to suggest that um, the uh, government failing to consult with stakeholders is. Uh, Sorry, I, again, I, I know that members opposite are anxious, and I, I think the reason why that they're anxious is because they're wanting me to speak up on behalf of them, because I know that they do not believe in the decision that was made in respect to Dauphin and the impact that it has had uh, on uh, Dauphin families and, again, Manitobans who are in conflict with the law. Uh, we know that um, certainly... Um, families of those that are in conflict with the law are concerned about their loved one's um, ability to access a program and rehabilitation services to be able to fully uh, uh, reintegrate into their communities and into Manitoba uh, as a result of being uh, moved further away. Uh, I think at this point, Deputy Speaker, it would be important to note that um, those folks that certainly were not consulted by this government, I mean, again, Deputy Speaker, I want to put it on the record that the, the, the Premier and the Minister of Justice failed to do any uh, consultations or give any heads up to workers. They certainly did not. Or I just want to remind the member that um, with the greatest respect, that the members should be focusing on the privilege, uh, their privilege house has been breached, privilege such as freedom of speech, freedom of, from uh, arrest of civil action, exception to jur jury duty, um, freedom of obstruction or intimidation, or dealing with the rights of the house as a collective, including the regulation of internal affairs of the house, the authority to maintain or att attendance of service of its members, the power of, to discipline, the right to in, in, institute inquiries and to call witnesses and demand papers, the right to administrator oaths of witnesses and the rights to publish papers. These are some of the that should be raised when trying to prove a prima facie a breach of privilege has occurred rather than debating policy issues. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Miigwech, uh, Deputy Speaker, for your excellent counsel. Uh, I, I would uh, offer uh, for your submission, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, that this is a prima facie case of privilege because of the Pallister government's conduct and that it interfered with my ability to advocate for the people of Dauphin and provide a meaningful solution to the closure of the Dauphin Correctional Facility. Uh, Deputy Speaker, further to that, um, the Pallister government's uh, conduct also interfered with the people of Dauphin's ability to judge the merit of um, this Pallister government and certainly judge the merit of the decision to close the Dauphin Correctional uh, Centre. Deputy Speaker, in, in laying out my uh, case in respect of uh, this matter of privilege, I would also suggest that the lack of information and the lack of communication prior to the announcement, as I have uh, previously stated in my preamble, uh, therefore interfered, interfered with my ability to fulfill my parliamentary duties, uh, Deputy Speaker. And that is, quite simply, to present the people of Manitoba, uh, the information uh, relevant to uh, said closure, and certainly, Deputy Speaker, uh, to hold the Pallister government to account. Um, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, it's important to note that in respect of this uh, lack of information and lack of communication, uh, it is a, a fact uh, that there was no consultation, no consultation or discussion with Manitobans who are currently, uh, or who at the time were housed in the Dauphin Correctional Facility, and how that would impact on their uh, own uh, lives as uh, uh, folks that are 
incarcerated in the Dauphin Correctional Facility. There was no consultation, there was no uh, discussion with folks who are at the mercy, who are really, really at the mercy of the Premier's whims and at the mercy of the Minister of Justice's um, uh, ability to carry out the whims of his boss. So, uh, Deputy Speaker, it does not allow for me to be able to do my job as the critic for justice in respect of particularly those Manitobans who are in conflict with the law and were housed at the Dauphin Correctional Centre. There was no information, there was no communication. Um, Deputy Speaker, uh, before I go on with, uh, with laying the facts of this matter of privilege, I want to point out Uh, that the Supreme Court, Deputy Speaker, gives helpful guidance that we ought to consider here as to whether or not a question of privilege exists. In its important decision, known as VAD, VAID, I've been corrected, Deputy Speaker, thank you. Thank you to. Um, uh, Justice Ian Binney wrote for the court uh, and found that, and I quote Deputy Speaker, legislative bodies created by the Constitution Act of 1867 do not constitute enclaves shielded from the ordinary law of the land, end quote Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the framers of the Constitution and Canadian parliamentarians in passing the Parliament uh, of Canada Act thought it right, thought it was right, to use the House of Commons at Westminster as the benchmark for parliamentary privilege in Canada. Uh, so therefore, uh, Deputy Speaker, accordingly to determine whether a privilege exists for the benefit of the Senate or House of Commons or their members, a court must decide whether the category or scope of the claimed privilege has been authoritatively established in relation to our own Parliament and to the House of Commons at Westminster. Deputy Speaker, uh, if so, the claim to privilege ought to be accepted by the court. However, if the existence and the scope of the privilege have not been authoritatively established, the court will be required to test the claim against the doctrine of necessity, uh, which uh, Deputy Speaker, as I am sure you are well aware, and as the House is well aware, this is the foundation of all parliamentary privilege. In such a case, in order to sustain a claim of privilege, the Assembly or member seeking its immunity must show that the sphere of activity for which privilege is claimed is so closely and directly connected with the fulfillment of the, by the Assembly or its members of their functions as a legislative or a deliberative body, including the Assembly's work in holding the government to account, that outside interference would undermine the level of autonomy required to enable the Assembly and its members to do their legislative work with dignity and efficiency. Deputy Speaker, once a claim to privilege is made out, the court will not inquire into the merits of its exercise of any particular incident. Instance, pardon me, Deputy Speaker. Certainly, Deputy Speaker, it could be argued that this is helpful, but it clearly raises the question 
what is the doctrine of necessity? And I know that that is something that every member in this House contemplates late at night. I, I understand that that's correct. Um, and so let's continue with that, Deputy Speaker. The court continued, and I quote, parliamentary privilege is defined by the decree of autonomy necessary to perform Parliament's constitutional function. Sir Erdstein May's leading text on the subject uh, defines parliamentary privilege as the sum of the particular rights enjoyed by each House collectively as a constituent part of the High Court of Parliament and by members of each House individually without which they could not discharge their functions and which exceed those possessed by other bodies or individuals." End quote, Deputy Speaker. So, Deputy Speaker, uh, let me just provide a bit of evidence uh, for your deliberations in this matter of privilege to explain the breaches of my uh, privilege. Uh, Deputy Speaker, on May 5, 2020, documents were tabled in the House which showed that the government, the Pallister government, the Premier or the Minister did no consultations as of September 2019 with, to name a couple of uh, stakeholders, the Mayor and Council of Dauphin, Indigenous communities, Indigenous leadership, Indigenous uh, citizens of Manitoba affected by the decision, employees of a Dauphin Correctional Facility, or families of Manitobans in conflict of, with the law uh, who were currently residing at the Dauphin Correctional uh, Center. Uh, perhaps, uh, Deputy Speaker, the only uh, folks who were consulted in the closure of the Dauphin Correctional Facility was actually the member for Dauphin himself as probably a means of heads up. Uh, and I perhaps would suggest to the House that it also too could probably not be uh, constructed as consultation. I would suggest, and one could only imagine, that it was a mere dictate from the Premier to the member for Dauphin that this was about to happen. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the closure of Dauphin Correctional Centre is a huge, massive decision and change for the city and the Parkland regions as a whole, Deputy Speaker. Uh, that is why it is quite concerning and problematic that there was no consultation done uh, regarding the decision to close the Dauphin Correctional Facility. facility. Uh, no, nor, Deputy Speaker, was there any um, indication that such a decision was coming down the pipe. Uh, and, and certainly, Deputy Speaker, the decision to close the Dauphin Correctional Facility was not anywhere noted or uh, spoken during the 2019, September 2019 provincial election. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in my role as critic for justice, I have scoured uh, all the information that came out uh, from the uh, PC uh, party in respect of their platform uh, and in respect of any documents, uh, uh, media scrums, media releases, anything like that, Deputy Speaker, and I could not find one single mention uh, in the September 2019 um, information or uh, discourse that was disseminated to Manitobans about the closure of the Dauphin Correctional Facility. Nowhere. So, uh, I think that that is important to note in uh, laying out the evidence and the arguments in the breach of my matter of privilege. The, uh, simply stated, Deputy Speaker, Manitobans did not know that this was coming. Citizens of Dauphin did not know that this was coming. 
Uh, and uh, I think that this is the clearest example of um, the Premier's uh, willingness to mislead Manitobans on decisions that are being made. Uh, and so, Deputy Speaker, you may be asking why this is concerning. The government, Deputy Speaker, the Pallister government, to be, to be clear, is uh, beginning to establish a very real pattern of failing to adequately consult with Manitobans on major changes that have uh, lasting impacts on the very lives of Manitobans. And repeatedly, Deputy Speaker, this continues to mislead members of this Manitoba Legislative Assembly uh, and Manitobans. And, Deputy Speaker, it therefore uh, interferes with my ability to hold this government, to hold the Premier, to hold the Pallister government to account and ensure that decisions are being made for the betterment of all. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I will continue um, with uh, relevant expert authorities. Um, Mengo defines privilege in part as, and I quote, the necessary immunity that the law provides for members of parliament and for members of the legislatures of each of the ten provinces and two territories in order for these legislators to do their legislative work, end quote, Deputy Speaker. That was on page 12. Uh, so to the question of, and again, this was uh, derived in the quote that I just noted, necessary in relation to what? Therefore, the answer of necessary to protect legislators in the discharge of their legislative and deliberative functions and the Legislative Assembly's work in holding the uh, Pallister government to account for the conduct of the country's business. To the same effort, um, Marlowe and Montpitsi, uh, House of Commons Procedure and Practice 2000, where privilege is defined as, and I quote, the rights and immunities that are deemed necessary for the House of Commons as an institution and its members as representatives of the electorate to fulfill their functions. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that quote can be, uh, end quote, and Deputy Speaker, that quote can be found on page 50. The member from Concordia loves page 50. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, reference may also be made to Brno, Parliamentary Procedure and Practice in the Domain of Canada, the fourth edi edition from 1916, Deputy Speaker. For your uh, information found on page 37. And I quote, it is obvious that no legislative assembly would be able to discharge its duties with efficiency or to assure its independence and dignity unless it had adequate powers to protect itself and its members and officials in the exercise of their functions. Further, Deputy Speaker, the British uh, Joint Committee Report adopted a similar approach uh, when it noted, and I quote, parliamentary privilege consists of the rights and immunities which the two houses of parliament and their members and officers possess to enable them to carry out their parliamentary functions effectively. Uh, without this protection, Deputy Speaker, members uh, would be handicapped in performing their parliamentary duties and the authority of Parliament itself in confronting the executive 
and as a forum for expressing the anxieties of citizens would be correspondingly diminished. Uh, and, Deputy Speaker, while the latitude is left to each House of Parliament, such an uh, approach to the definition of privilege implies important limits. There is general recognition, for example, that privilege attaches to, and I quote, proceedings in Parliament, end quote. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Deputy Speaker, as stated in May, the 19th edition, from 1976, at page 89, not, and I quote, everything that is done or said within the chamber during the transaction of business forms part of the proceedings in Parliament. Particular words or acts may be entirely unrelated to any business which is in course of transaction or is in a more general sense before the House as having been ordered to come before it in due course." End quote, Deputy Speaker. Thus, in R versus Bunting, Deputy Speaker, in 1885, on page 524, I believe. For example, Deputy Speaker, the Queen's Bench Division held that a conspiracy to bring about change in the government by bribing members of the provincial legislature was not in any way connected with a proceeding in Parliament, and therefore the court had jurisdiction to try that very offence. Further, again, Deputy Speaker, in laying out my argument in uh, my breach of privilege in this House and the ability for me to do my job as the MLA for St. John's, further, uh, May, the 23rd edition, Erskine May, the 23rd edition, refers to an opinion of, and I quote, the Privileges Committee uh, in 1815 that the re-arrest of Lord Cochrane, Deputy no. Speaker, Lord Cochrane was arrested apparently, a member of the Commons in the chamber, and this is in brackets, Deputy Speaker, the House was not sitting. Uh, was not in breach of privilege. It goes on to state particular words or acts may, may be Order. entirely unrelated to any business being transacted or ordered to come before the House in due course. End quote, Deputy Speaker. That uh, whole qu uh, quote about Lord Cochrane can be found on page 116. The connection, Deputy Speaker, between necessity and the legislative function is also emphasized in the British Joint Committee report. And, Deputy Speaker, the notes in the British Joint Committee report that the dividing line between privileged and non-privileged activities of each House is not easy to define, Deputy Speaker. You're going to have a very difficult time in this decision, uh, but I will suggest that the arguments that I am laying out will um, move towards our favour. Perhaps the nearest approach to a definition that is the areas in which the courts ought not to intervene extend beyond proceedings in Parliament, but the privileged areas must be closely and directly connected with proceedings in Parliament. That intervention by the courts could Order. be... <clears throat> the hour being 5 p.m., the House is now adjourned and stands adjourned until 1.30 tomorrow.